Greetings, and welcome to my pirate ship. This pirate ship is designed to be an exoskeleton of my nervous system. If the heart of my nervous system is my actual physical heart, which produces an electrical signal, and the common experience of that is love, then my nervous system runs on love. According to Daniel Goldsman in um, his book, Social Intelligence, babies, uh, he, there's a lot of interesting stuff about neurology in this book, babies require their mother and require their mother holding them and speaking to them in baby ease. The there is a mathematical and scientific way to describe the way a mother talks to a baby because it's cross-cultural. Women from all cultures make the same kind of mother ease, and they think that mother ease is a way of synchronizing baby with mom, um, or, you know, caretaker, because it doesn't have to technically be mom, uh, in order to boot up the emotional system, boot up the nervous system, but this also boots up the um, conscience system, the empathy system between, uh, for a baby. Um, after World War II, after all the bombing in Europe, there were large um, orphanages, you know, with hundreds of babies and just a few nuns uh, to look after them, just a few women taking care of them. And a large percentage of these um, babies turned into psychopaths, the people with the inability to have emotional connection with another person. They say that one in 20 people, and when I say they, I think this is a John Ronston, uh, the psychopath test. He talks to different psychopaths, people with psychopathic tendencies, according to this self-reporting scale of psycho psychopathy. And then when he does that, he basically, you know, looks at where they're placed in society. And what he finds is that sometimes um, in organizations, someone with a high degree of psychopathy or a lack of ability to em empathically relate to another rises to the top of an org. Um, this has got to be a very unfun organization to um, be a part of because if you're he John Ronston he basically says look if you're if you don't have any regard for your fellow people you easily don't have regard for the planet or the environmental systems all of which require empathy uh, you can make some pretty you know draconian um, you can make some pretty draconian moves and you can get people to do things, you can set policies that that let people essentially operate outside of empathy for the bottom line. So long story short, psychopathy is rewarded in this sometimes in a society, in a corporation structure that basically becomes heartless. So baby ease, nervous system, my heart, from my heart to yours. Um, <laughs> reclaiming the nervous system, reclaiming the, um, the sovereignty. That means uh, nothing between you and the source of the nervous system is one of the themes of these broadcasts, uh, my pirate ship. So my pirate ship is all of the technology, is the lab, is the extension of my nervous system. I call this ship uh, Tocorio 1.0 environment. If I was naming the ship, I might name it the Blue Yonder just because that sounds fun in this moment. <laughs> Over the blue yonder. <laughs> the, um, the extension of my nervous system, what that means is that this environment is the environment that I learn in. My invitation to you is to create an environment like this for yourself. Obviously, you don't have to have um, your environment is going to reflect the things that work well for your nervous system, the things that work well for your culture, your history, your way of looking at the world. When you have a Tocorio 1.0 environment, and uh, I think of this as a scale on uh, between 0 and 1, so it's kind of like a statistical or a mathematical function. Um, if you're at a Tocorio 0, on this spectrum, you are in an environment that does not support your nervous system at all. So those poor kids that lost their parents in World War II with all the bombing, the destruction of Europe, they got put in a little crib and they there wasn't enough time or energy or um, for, the, for the nuns to pick them up and hold them and to give them the time and uh, comfort that they needed. Those kids, they're, they're in a decorio zero environment. There's no receptivity for the nervous system in the environment. Uh, a Tocorio 1.0 would be like the perfect um, 
perfect teacher that all they did was pay attention to that nervous system, that child, and uh, come up with the perfect way to train and teach that, that child. I have a fantasy sometimes that if we get artificial intelligence, general purpose artificial intelligence, one of the most amazing applications for it would be to, for education. Education and, and teaching people is extremely difficult uh, and it doesn't scale well. Because if you think about this model, meaning you got to have mom and baby um, together, that's fine if mom, if you have a mom per baby, but if you don't have a mom per baby, it all fails. It's the same thing in a teaching environment in schools. The how do you scale education when really it's human connection that boots up the nervous system and it's human connection that makes a classroom environment um, viable, uh, interesting, something you actually want to plug into. Um, I'm a teacher and I've been a teacher in college for 10 years. I taught in trade schools and trade schools I taught in a number, three or four of them. Uh, what's cool about a trade school is that you have an extremely practical goal for the entire set of classes that students teach. When I say I'm a college professor, I am a special kind of college professor because I taught in a small um, kind of impoverished uh, school where we didn't have enough resources, we didn't have enough teachers. Um, that's a common experience in teaching in America. This was a private uh, 501c3, so it was a nonprofit, but it was a private institution. And uh, my students were mostly poor, um, mostly from the city, um, and mostly uh, minority. I think like 90 plus percent of my students were a minority, most of them Latino. And um, most of them young women, young women who had a family, you know, they were 18, 19, 20, and they already had a family with one, two, or three kids in it. Uh, moms turn out to be some of the best students out there because if you're a mom and you have to run a house and you have to perform childcare and you love your kids and you perform it well, all, all moms love their kids, but like if you actually execute on the task of running a home and it's smooth, like there's meals on the table, there's bedtimes, there's some kind of discipline, there's some kind of order, some kind of structure, so that if you're a kid in that house and you go into that house, you're, you thrive and you, uh, you, you do well. If you do that, college is really simple. And um, college, you know, the thing about my classroom is it looked a lot like this. I used the same rug. I had a lot of the same decorations on the walls. Anybody who's been a student in my classroom, and I have a couple thousand students out there over the years, um, they're going to recognize a lot of what I'm doing here. And this one is for you, you guys. This one is the class that I always wanted to teach, but because of the focus that we had, uh, trade focus, meaning there was always a practical skill set that one needed to arrive at at the end of your training, that was my primary reason for not dipping into these kinds of contents. Um, the other reason was is because of, you know, separation of church and state. Um, my school was like most schools. We relied on federal funding, which means that every student that came through the door was essentially taking out a loan, and I treated my class time in front of those students um, it was very serious because they only they had a limited amount of time that they were going to be there. Every day, every subject, everything that we talked about had to relate to what they were going to learn so that they had that, that skill when they left. That focus on skill, that focus on coming up with something that's, that really works and that you can apply in your nervous system, that's real learning. That's a, when, you, when you lay down a tuition, what you hope to get when you leave is that. A, a, an experience in your nervous system, not abstract, but an applied experience in your nervous system of doing something, okay? The, um, the, the thinking there is that, you know, and the difference between a standard classroom, I went to college. Uh, I went to college, I went to nine different colleges. I had different majors at every college. When I was a teenager and I had my first experience of God, I was convinced that this was the most important knowledge out there and that I should, so maybe it's a past life memory, for maybe just a, um, if you don't believe in past lives, then maybe it's an epigenetic memory, maybe a memory that follows my um, family, uh, maybe it's just a cultural memory. I had a, a certainty that if this was the most important thing, the experience that I had had, if that was the most important thing, that should be taught in college. You should be able to go to college and say, hey, uh, you guys know about the, the heart, the point source that's at the heart of all things. You guys must know that our reality is more like a kind of like a hologram, right? Like there's this 
undifferentiated consciousness at the heart of it all, and out of that comes a, a, a Paul, a Reverend Paul, and out of it comes all these other people and all these other things, and, you know, how do we navigate this thing? Like, that was my, that was my thought. Now, I know if you're listening to this, you're going to be laughing because you're like, ha ha ha, that shit's not taught anywhere, and you're exactly right about that. Um, it's not taught anywhere, um, and it is taught in some places. It's taught right here, and this is our classroom. So, I want to talk about I want to talk about that skill set. What is the skill set? What is the lived nature of being able to commune with God daily, at will, inside, and perhaps with other people? And how does it look? So this Decorio 1.0 environment is a is a is a classroom that you can interact with. And um, I've got a couple different threads I want to go down here. I want to talk about VR, but I also want to talk about Maria Montessori, and I want to talk about the nature of the human nervous system and how we actually learn. So a couple different things on the table here. Um, let's do Maria Montessori, because that feels hot. So Montessori, she's amazing, okay? Um, when you're thinking about famous women in history, study Maria Montessori. She was a physician. Um, a doctor in Italy in the early 1900s. And um, that was pretty amazing anyway. For a woman to be a physician, that's crazy. She must have, what she had probably had to go through at that time to become a physician and hang out with the dudes, which uh, I can't imagine. Uh, it must have been, she must have had to overcome so much more shit to get to, get to where she's going to go. But here's why she's a true genius. So she's a doctor. And um, there is a way that they handle uh, retarded children, uh, children with learning disabilities, um, what we would call developmentally handicapped or um, perhaps developmentally impaired. But I bet, you know, people with extreme forms of dyslexia would fit into this category. Um, people with, you know, autism, early forms of it, uh, spectrum disorders, this kind of stuff. So anybody who didn't hit the mark in terms of their mental nature would be kind of excommunicated in a way, torn out of, taken out of the normal culture and put into this one thing. So here's what happened to those kids. Those kids would be stripped of their clothes, so made naked, put into a cell, a cold cell, a jail cell, and you know, they would be naked in this cold room and they would be fed by you know putting food on a plate and then throwing it in the door. Imagine the dehumanizing experience of your interaction with the world, your Tecorio environment, coming up with a fat zero, maybe like a point one or something, right? Your, your, your whole interaction, your whole way of neurological communication with the world is through this mediated prisoner experience, right? Okay, so Maria Montessori, I'm making a long story short. These insights that I have come from a book called The Science of Maria Montessori. And essentially, that book covers nine different approaches or theories in, that Maria Montessori had and then backs it up with scientific research for why it's such a good thing. Um, we see a lot of uh, examples of how Montessori-based education has been very successful in our world. Both of the founders, uh, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google, um, they went to Montessori schools and the thinking behind a Montessori school, oh. <laughs> I'm going to turn this off, the thinking behind a Montessori school, the way that Montessori's children are trained in their nervous systems, direct interaction, that prepared those two to, to see the world in a new way, basically in an honest way. When you're looking at the world through your experience, you're looking at it through your nervous system. That is kind of different than looking at the world through the way the culture paints it for you. And right now, you know, uh, this is 2020. This is the second day of Lent in 2020. And, um, you know, we're in a McCarthyism. We're in an intellectual McCarthyism. Anytime you've got other people telling you how to think, or how to act, or how to behave as an adult, there should be a ton of red flags, red flag fireworks that go off inside you. And you should be like, wait a minute, why do these other adults, are, why are they so worried about what I'm doing? Now, if you're running down the street with a giant knife and you're like, I'm going to get you, your explanation is you're acting crazy, okay? But if there is nothing like that going on, if you're just behaving normally, trying to go to work, trying to go to school, trying to do whatever you're supposed to be doing in life, and you're getting people that say, hey, you need to behave differently. Hey, you need to think differently. This is thought crime, and this is thought police. And McCarthyism in the 1950s, the Red Scare, the idea was, um, you know, 
Joseph McCarthy tried had all these trials where they hauled actors, artists, and they, they basically tried to get rid of communism. You know, that didn't work out. They did not find communists all, you know, embedded throughout Hollywood. Um, if you want to see a pretty funny movie about that, Hail Caesar by the Coen brothers. It's a, it's a cool movie uh, that talks about kind of like a Christ nature, uh, sort of the nature of Jesus Christ, I guess, although he's not mentioned in the movie. <laughs> the uh, There's this one amazing scene where they've got um, the picture of God and uh, they're watching dailies. So they're watching these, um, you know, dailies are like you go out and you shoot, you know, 10 hours of film and then you watch the dailies and you only end up using a few seconds of it because, you know, you just need the, the chariot pulling down the thing. Anyway, image of the divine and um, <laughs> there's like a... <laughs> It's like the there's like a title card that says image of the di divine removed, you know, or will be added in post or whatever the processing. Anyway, it's funny because it's like, you know, there's a the Coen brothers um, have a Jewish orientation towards their cinema and their filmmaking. And, uh, you know, there's a prohibition in the Jewish faith from from having an image of God. I think that's a great joke. One of my favorite parts of that movie <laughs> is when... Uh, um, George Clooney, the main guy, he's like, he's supposed to be standing in front of Jesus and he goes, and the director is like over him and he's like, he's like this and he goes, squint, squint at the grandeur. <laughs> it's just, it's very funny. You should check it out. Uh, wow. Dramatically losing my thread here. Um, Maria Montessori, good classrooms. Okay. So she's, uh, here's what she does. She basically goes into the classroom and she, um, she doesn't, she doesn't have a classroom. She's not in a classroom yet. She's in the prison cell. She goes into the prison cell and what she does is she puts clothes on the kids. She, um, puts food on little tiny tables for them, comes up with little pieces of furniture, little places for the kids to actually sit, um, gives them little desks and things like this. And what she finds is that by simply engaging the nervous system, by treating the person holistically, she's able to, if this is the standard of her day for educational care, she's able to get these, um, these developmentally challenged kids up to this level, right? And here's the real genius of Maria Montessori. She doesn't stop there, as this is outlined in her book, The Science of Maria Montessori, that book. Um, what she says is, listen, if I can get these people who were thought of to not be able to learn up to this kind of a level, why can't I get regular people much higher? So she goes back to school. She becomes a, um, a teacher, gets her degree in education, you know, basically, probably some advanced degree. I, I should know more about it. Um, easy to research it. And uh, not only does she become a doctor, but she becomes an educator in her society. And she goes on to found the Maria Montessori method of early childhood development, which is very much in line with the science. Anytime you do science in relation to learning and the nervous system, and it's real science, not bullshit funded by whatever, for whatever reason, uh, kind of educational uh, research, whenever you do the real thing, what you find is that getting the nervous system in alignment with actual reality is a great thing because it, 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 the nerve, the human nervous system is designed to plug into our world. Okay. So that was her, that was her insight that, uh, one of her core insights is that it is the doing of things, the practicing of things in our nervous system that allows us to, um, that is real learning. So think about the kind of learning that we do in colleges when you, I had, I had classes where I had to have 300, 400 people in a room, giant lecture hall, and one teaching assistant standing down there. In an entire semester, I'd be lucky if I learned five or 10 names of the people around me. I'd never have any personal interaction with the teacher. Imagine how, now just think about how far that is removed from holding a baby and basically looking them in the eyes, lining up your face, having like an, oh, an emotional connection between um, parent and child. That boot up process that um, Daniel Goldsman describes in uh, um, social intelligence, we need that throughout our whole life. <laughs> we need something like it. You don't need people standing around going blah, 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 blah. But what you do need is real people looking you in the eye and having real emotional transmission to you. That's why this format is so important. I, um, I stopped teaching, I, my, my, I stopped teaching a um, little more than a year, year and a half ago, 
And I, I stopped teaching because the school I was a part of closed down. So the, you know, the regulation of the, of the U.S. government closed down our trade school, which was pretty successful, very successful in terms of getting students through the gates needed to actually have a set of skills. And the regulation, I got to see it from the inside out. It was bullshit, you know? It was the kinds of stuff they were talking about was so far removed from my classroom as a teacher and had nothing to do with what was actually going on in there. Um, I don't mean to dismiss my entire, the, the whole school I was in too, you know? The, um, some of the administrators I had, the really smart ones were just like, Paul, we see that you have a wonderful effect with the kids, with your students. We get a lot of good reports from your students. So go crazy, you know, kind of take it to the next level. All right. And I had mix, I had a mixed bag of people above me. I had some of the coolest people I've ever worked with managing me. And I had some of the worst people I've ever worked with managing me. And I got to tell you, the pressures on a teacher are immense, right? And the time pressures, the energy pressures, the money pressures. I mean, this is all stuff that, uh, these are all pressures that, you know, just the format of education put on us. I think you'll hear a common, uh, similar story from most teachers. If you talk to any kind of teacher who's teaching in America at any level, they're going to give you the similar kind of feedback. Now, that is an awesome environment for a number of reasons, because when you are faced with great pressure and great challenge, you have to rise to that and you have to figure out a way that it's going to work for your students. So Maria Montessori understood in the early 1900s, like every parent understands intuitively, that real education is about engagement. It's about actually doing something. It's about doing something with your body. It's about bringing your whole nervous system to bear. A nervous system, it's got a voice, it's got eyes, it's got ears, it's got arms, it's got legs, it's got dreams, imagination, the meta nervous system of dreaming, you know, imagine imaginative function. And a child is a package of all of this stuff, just yeah, coming at you, you know, from many, many, many different um, angles at the same time, many different uh, parts of the spectrum. Uh, so this environment and the reason why we're in 360, the reason why we're theoretically on a headset right now is because every time you mediate Every time you create something, you create it within a frame. The frame is important because the frame defines the audience, okay? When someone makes a movie and they get out a camera and they shoot it, they are shooting it for an audience. And that frame says, take the whole universe and this frame, these people, this time, that's what I am, that's what I'm dialing in. When you experience it in the audience of a movie theater, you are, it, there's a lot of things that go into it. Are you experiencing it on film? With, is it a film that's been played a hundred thousand, you know, a thousand times and it's scratchy, you know, shh, a bad film? Or is it a 4K uh, projection? Is it an 8K projection? You know, the, the, that K, that, that's the number, that's the bits of resolution. Theoretically, the higher the level of projection, the more, the, the clearer that window is into the human nervous system. So my pirate ship, this ship is awash in what I, international intellectual waters. Uh, we might pull into one harbor and stay there for a while. We might pull into another harbor and stay there a while. But I'm the captain of this ship, of this pirate ship. And uh, we are going to be charting some amazing territory here. Um, <sighs> It's important to, for me, that uh, you guys understand the theory behind this stuff. The theory is not impo as important as someone actually learning something. So what is our goal here? Our goal is to experience God for oneself in one's nervous system and to provide the exoskeleton, the framework around it, so that that core experience of the divine is supported in one's life. This is an old tradition. This tradition goes back to these people called the desert and mother, the desert fathers and the desert mothers of um, the early Christian tradition. So history, um, Jesus born zero AD. Uh, we reset all of the time in the 1500s. Um, 
I think I was, I was listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's got a great, he's got some great stories about this. It was the Jesuits, the Jesuits and their astronomical observatories that um, basically were able to tie in the date of Easter to the veneral, the veneral equinox. Basically, uh, you've got the winter solstice and the summer solstice, and then the two middle points uh, between those two events are the um, are the equinox. The equinox is the equal half day. So an equinox is when the day and the night are the same. It's it's like the same length, um, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, and the uh, quick Wikipedia search will clear that up for any anybody out there who's confused about that. And. Um, those anyway, the the Easter kept drifting on the calendar. So the Jesuit astronomers um, did some very specific astronomical calculations. They were able to create the Gregorian calendar for Pope uh, Gregory at the time, and we still use that um, in order to. Uh, that's that's still our calendar, although we make little micro improvements on it. It was it was the the thinking that said that hey. Every four years, you have to add one day. Every so many, um, every so many years, you have to have a, a leap day. And if you keep up on, if you keep this up, the date and the time of Easter, which was the whole point of it, celebrating Easter, um, that thing lines up with roughly the same season. If you use the old calendar, the one before the Gregorian calendar, Easter drifts on you. So it's this interest in Easter. That is, uh, and the timing of Easter that actually goes back um, a long, a pretty long way into time. So you've got these desert fathers, and um, you've got this guy, Saint Anthesis, Anthesis, A T H A N A C S I U S. He was the uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, and this is in the year 1367. In 1367. He sends out a letter, a festive uh, letter, uh, an, an Easter letter. And in the letter, he says to all of the, okay, he sends out this letter. Who does he send it out to? He sends it out to all these monasteries. These monasteries are located um, all throughout the Middle East, uh, Egypt and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, the same way that Jesus, um, you know, went out into the desert uh, for his 40 days of fasting. Um, this is the same kind of tradition that gets carried on. Once Jesus is... Um, crucified in 33 AD. Um, when he's crucified, uh, he, there is a tradition that is carried on that seeks to have people interact with, with Jesus. It seeks to have people um, interact with God. And, they, and the, the experience that Jesus was talking about in his ministry was one of getting in contact with God. Okay? Getting in contact with God for oneself, and clearly through the miracles of Jesus and the other things that Jesus was able to do. I mean, um, I know people don't, there's tons of people out there that don't believe those miracles are real. Here's the thing about a miracle. You, a miracle, if you don't, if it's not for you, if you don't experience a miracle for yourself, if you're not the intended audience of the miracle, you can see the effect of a miracle um, a few minutes later, a few seconds later, you can see the effect of a miracle in someone's consciousness by the transformation that it that it had. So, you know, however you think about miracles, you know, a miracle, what it probably is, is it's an advanced form of consciousness. It's an advanced form of physics because it really ha miracles happen in our if m miracles happen in our world they happen in this reality okay so good science would basically take a step back and be like huh can't explain what happened got a lot of anecdotal because we didn't have instruments uh, I I evidence in place we've also got these hearts and these minds of these humans these human nervous systems here how can uh, we validate all this you know how can we actually approach it so real science doesn't Real science is, is a questioning and a, and a reproducing kind of thing. Real science could, uh, could make observations about what's going on. And we have, you know, thousands of years of anecdotal evidence of miracles all the time. Uh, part of what I'm talking about, um, when you're talking about having a relationship, a one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face relationship with the divine in a way that works for you, you're talking about becoming um, a child of God. A child of God in the sense of you are a son or a daughter of God. And people who are 
very interested in the divine, who make it a priority in their life, who seek it out, who try to communicate it to other people, who try to try to basically get the message out about the nature of the divine, okay? Um, sometimes we call those people saints. Saint is like a word that you apply to someone. And the Catholic Church, you know, they've got their saints. They've got a huge tradition of saints. Anybody that you hear about in antiquity is almost saint someone, saint someone, saint, saint whoever. Uh, this guy is a saint, um, basically one of the early fathers. I wrote his name down so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, the Bishop of Alexandria. <sighs> this experience of, um, maybe there's an experience of sainthood where like, someone gets, you know, the rest of the community, the, in this case, the Catholic community says, yeah, this person is a saint because of these miracles, because of these attitudes, because of these kinds of things. There's a, a legal process in Rome to go through it. Did you know that there are literally hundreds and thousands of people that get nominated for sainthood every year? The Roman Catholic Church is slow, like a legal system, by design. Okay, there is a legal aspect, a governmental aspect to Catholicism, and then there is this thing in the middle of it, the, the experiences that the individuals in that organization are having, okay? It's possible for individuals within any religion, any group of people, to be having a real experience of the divine, all right? In my book, that is not a function of the religious practices or the legal system, tribal, whatever. It's, that stuff can set you up for success. It can also set you up for failure. But when it comes down to it, that individual experience of God, that is a struggle of an individual to with all of creation, okay? That is, that is an individual soul trying to understand how it was created, why it was created, what it's supposed to do with its life. Um, this is the this is the area of saints. This is the a saint in my book is someone who you can be in the world, you can be engaged in the world, trying to do cool shit for other people. You can also be um, removed from the world, and your service your service to the world happens in consciousness. You know, if you're a Himalayan master, you know, in northern Tibet, and you're sitting in some cave today, and you're like, and you're like, you're holding the fabric of consciousness together for humanity, and maybe more, you're serving a purpose, you're creating kind of a, a, a rail that people can go on. The mind is a very powerful thing. It is part of the electromagnetic spectrum of, uh, it is part of the electromagnetic experience and it uses the electromagnetic spectrum, electrons and such, to mediate the experience. Um, that's why uh, media and symbols, and uh, you know, when you, if you watch too much TV, if you watch too much of one channel on TV, you're gonna get indoctrinated with the experiences of the people on that channel. Switch the channel to something else, you're gonna get indoctrinated with the experiences from another time, or from another, from another point of view. Watch an old newscast, watch old TV, and you're going to be receiving a historical electromagnetic document from the past of people communicating that, okay? My Tibetan master sitting in the, in northern uh, India there, um, like doing electromagnetic work, potentially that, that signal, that carrier wave potentially goes through the whole electromagnetic process that is the planet, all right? This is a, um, a lever that God has given us where we can, we can structure and arrange consciousness. And like someone like an Aristotle, a Plato, the, what they're doing as a great teacher in history is they're creating a groove in a book and they're writing down their thoughts and that groove is a groove that you can follow, okay? You have, a, you have the instrument necessary to vibrate the electromagnetic spectrum. And being a human, unless there's some cats and dogs that someone has put a VR goggle on here, you can, uh, which, you know, you can, they can work on their, on their angle. Um, <laughs> you can, you can, you contribute to humanity through the mechanism of the quality of the way that your heart and your mind work together. There are these really sweet scientists out in, um, 
California, Southern California, right south of San Francisco, out in the Redwoods. And they have a place called the HeartMath Institute. And Roland McCready, he's one of the top 10 um, cited scientists in the world. You can look it up. His, um, when you look at like references of scientific papers, he has done work on hearts and heart rate variability and on energy uh, literal energy in the in the heart system, in the mind system, and how these things come together. Um, the HeartMath Institute is the scientific piece, and there is HeartMath, um, the educational kind of piece that provides training to people, that, that you can go and you can learn the HeartMath techniques. These guys are the people I've run across uh, 20 years ago, um, in about around 2000, and they had some extremely cool theories and some practical tools for taking the heart and balancing it with the mind and essentially empowering the mind through a constant connection with the heart. <sighs> there is a group, a specific project within the HeartMath Institute called the Global um, Coherence Initiative, GCI. And you can go to the website, you can Google that, and you can look at all the science. It's, it's a lot of science and it's fun science. Because what they show scientifically, and they have papers coming out that are showing this kind of stuff, is that there is a two-way communication function between the human nervous system and other people and the planet and maybe even beyond the planet. There is a humans affect the electromagnetic spectrum of our planet and the, 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 the harmonics particularly. So we're not talking about raw voltage. Like my, my heart is creating a strong electromagnetic field, especially in this room. Because you're a human and because you have a human nervous system, when you see my gestures, when you see my facial expressions, the 1 20th of a second pulses, the micro expressions on my face, you will have an empathic experience of being here with me in this space. Okay, that is mediated through the electromagnetic spectrum, the recording, however you're, you're, you're picking up uh, this material. All right, it's gonna cause a certain reaction inside of you because it's mediated by this extra technology, this 360 technology. Now, even if we didn't have this recording going, and even if I was just here in my, in my lab, um, and I was just saying these things to an empty room, what the HeartMath Institute says is that the quality of my coherence, the quality of my heart-brain connection is being broadcast, is going out into the world. And other people are picking this up. And they are, um, they are it's, a, it's just a function of being human, that we exist inside this soup. There's some really cool science uh, in that GCI document that talks about sunspots. So Roland explained this to me um, a couple months ago. It's really good shit. Take the Earth, right? The Earth has an electromagnetic field, all right? The reason it has an electromagnetic field is because the, the heart of the Earth is metal. It's a, it's a metal core. That metal core is moving, all right? That moving metal core um, creates the, um, the electromagnetic... Uh, force that is expressed as the um, lines of energy that a compass finds. So when you take out a compass and you stand here, I'm in Colorado in beautiful United States of America. I, I live on the top of a mountain. And if I take my compass, it's got a little piece of metal and it goes vroom, and that one, one, the one side of that piece of metal points towards the North Pole and the other side points towards the South Pole. And the reason why is because there is a flowing river of energy that is coming from the core of the planet. It's bursting out of the top of the Earth. It's turning around, it's going back down, and it's coming back in the, the bottom of the Earth. And it's, 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 a, it's a living cycle, a living system. It turns out that our bodies are the same. That same toroidal shape of field. Toroidal means circle, or toroid means, I think, circle in Latin. So if you take a, a toroidal field, imagine a donut, okay? A donut with a point in the middle, all right? That point in the middle would be for the earth, the, the heart of the earth, okay? For a human system, that point would be right in the middle of the heart. It's the um, biophysical uh, uh, level. Sorry about the noise. It's the biophysical level of our, of our being. And 
what's cool about it is that we have instruments that can measure this thing. So when they measure this bioelectrical field of the human body, they, they find it's about, you know, they've, they've got magnetometers, um, scientific instruments that measure magnetic resonance that can get, you know, they, it can basically sense it around here. But when we get more sensitive um, tools, we will probably be able to sense more of this kind of stuff. And this is the point where I think science has to be humble. Because just because science doesn't have the instrument to detect it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And this is where science um, could, it would be really cool if we could get back to the kind of science that we had when we were inventing science in the 1600s and the 1700s, where, you know, there were so many things that were undiscovered that we would, um, uh, basically anybody could be a scientist. You could be a scientist by going out your front door and by grabbing a bug and being like, huh, I wonder why this bug walks along and all this kind of stuff. One of the little tricks that the mind does is that, you know, oh, we understand um, some of the bugs. You know, we've, we've got names for some of the bugs. Someone came up with a name for the way the arms, you know, the, the, the parts and the pieces and all this kind of thing. Here's the truth. It's just because you have a name for it, just because you have theories, and just because you have some people in history that have worked on this particular problem, doesn't mean that that particular problem is done. It doesn't mean that you have, um, you have finished doing that. Um, hopefully we're going to get some uh, relief here on the sound. We'll see. That's my pump. The, uh, my home is, uh, we have a pump that goes down 700 some odd feet into the ground and it pulls water out of the ground and uh, uh, fills up a cistern here. So clearly uh, someone in my home is using some water. Um, we will get this, uh, we will get this fixed. I wonder if what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pause here and then I'm going to pick this up. I'm going to try to eliminate the sound. Let's give that a shot. There we go. Hey, it stopped. That's good enough for me. All right. We didn't even have to, we didn't even have to stop. So, okay. Heart math, electricity, the earth. All right. Check this shit out. So you take the earth and you've got these bands of energy, right? Now the earth turns once every 24 hours. We call that a day. If you put a, put a line through the earth and you rotate it, there's a, there's a side that's facing the sun. Right now it's sunny outside where I live in uh, North America. So that means we're facing towards the sun. Oh, everything needs a little more love here in my environment. Okay, all right. Whew. During the day, sun is the earth is facing the sun. Now imagine all of those little bands of energy that go, that, that electromagnetic system of the sun. And that then now the sun itself, or the earth, sorry, the sun is enormous and it's a very far away, big distance away. And that's good because it's a nuclear furnace and it's producing all kinds of energy. The energy that comes out of the sun is sometimes called the solar wind. Um, when, when we have these things called coronal mass ejections, um, uh, CMEs, they're basically big sun burps. The sun is this other field. Could be, you could think of it as a living field. And its energy system goes up really high sometimes. And when it burps and there's increased solar activity, that solar activity hits the earth. And the way that Roland described it is imagine all of these all of these electromagnetic fields as like guitar strings. And you're like plucking these guitar strings as the earth turns. So imagine it like a sound, because we have to use our nervous system. That's how, that's what we're doing. We're metaphors, my friends. So we take the earth and we turn it. And it's imagine these strings getting getting hit and plucked by the sun's energy as it as it arrives. So doom, 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 as the earth is turning around, right? That plucking of the electromagnetic system means that right outside my window and yours, there, is, there are electromagnetic fields that we can't see that are receiving energiz energization. Okay, this two-way communication between a human and the environment. I think it, it happened, it's not raw energy, okay? My little heart compared to the power of the sun is nothing from an energetic perspective. But what about carrier wave? What about the idea that my heart is an electromagnetic signal and I can encode information into the carrier wave, all right? Through my intentions, through my expressions. This, these um, variations in my electromagnetic signal that I'm sending out are 
those are the kinds of things, those kinds of signals are the kinds of signals that could be um, picked up by other people. All right. That is the, there is a, an information exchange between these two. You got to see the science for the, for the scientific uh, proof of it. But one of the, one of the neat data points is um, what they do, or what Roland did is he went back and he looked at all of the sunspot activity. Oh, there was this Russian scientist. I forget his name. And he's the one who did this. Um, but uh, there was like, what he did is he went back and he looked at bursts of extra energy coming from the sun. When this, when the, when we get more energy from the sun, and then he correlated that to wars and to upheavals in human activity. So long story short, when the sun puts out more energy and it plucks these electromagnetic strings of the earth and it adds that vibration into our planet, the humans have more energy. And when we have more energy and not a good way, not a good way to apply that energy, we go to war with each other and we get into more kinds of conflict. It's very interesting. My own theory now. Wouldn't it be so cool is if uh, we, we forced our leaders to pay a tax based on solar output. So if you wanted to get into a conflict at a time when there was low solar input, we'd be like, all right, maybe there's a real reason why you need to get into a conflict between our people and another people or at least it's not taxed. But when that solar energy goes up, we could measure that solar energy and we could say, hey, leaders, you gotta be better leaders right now because we've got more energy as people, more just, ah! And it's gonna be easy to whip us up and get us confused and scared and off balance and you know, get us war ready and like we're gonna have to go and attack someone else. So in any event, I would check out that GCI information. Um, we'll talk about it a lot. So. My, the reason I brought this up is because my Tibetan master, uh, this, this is an imaginary person, uh, in northern India, he's sitting in his cave and he's contributing. You're contributing too. You can contribute by um, refining the quality of your electromagnetic expression. You know, the Hindus, they have a, um, a uh, long history of recording these kinds of inner emotional spiritual states. Um, the Vedas, they... Uh, the reason why Hindus don't feel like they have to convert anybody is that they have, they have um, um, their sadhus, sadhus, um, rishis, rishis, sadhus are the ones that like to smoke the cannabis. Um, some really cool people. Uh, and northern, uh, northern India, up there, that's where they, they do it a lot. Um, it's the Shiva, the Shivite religions that really get into their bong, which is the oral form, um, the orally active form of cannabis. And smoking cannabis, which is a different chemistry, a different kind of chemical, um, a tool for spiritual focus and progress and awareness for a very long time. The cannabis is a very special thing. It's a very special thing for me. It's a healing medicinal plant that um, has given me a life of uh, great flexibility. Um, really the reason why you're even getting to experience uh, what's going on here is because of cannabis for me. Um, I was, in 2000, I developed very intense back and uh, um, hamstring pain. It was very painful. Um, it happened every time I moved. So every time I went from a seated position to a standing position, every time I walked or took a step, I would get a voltage, a jolt of pain in my body. And um, that went on for 12 years. On the pain scale, which is very subjective, I would put myself at about an eight most days. Um, you know, I'd wake up in pain, I'd function all day in pain, I'd go to sleep in pain. I tried everything. I tried massage therapy. I tried, uh, was a massage therapist for a number of years. I tried acupuncture. I tried um, physical therapy. I tried diet. I tried exercise. I took three years off of, of gluten. I took one year off of sugar, nothing, not even like the, the sweetness that's in a pack of honey or a, a pack of uh, ketchup, you know, on like your fries at McDonald's or whatever. Um, I, I tried everything. I tried everything. The only thing that would do it is this stuff called Bextra, which they took off the market, which was basically a super powerful form of ibuprofen, Advil. Um, the, if I took a handful of ibuprofen, like six ibuprofen, I could knock out my pain and I could effectively stand up and move around without having any, any trouble doing that. Um, in 2012, 
I was um, living in southern uh, southwest Colorado, and I voted along with uh, eighty percent of the people that I lived with to uh, in our little county, a very small county, mostly farmers and stuff, but a lot of cool people, a lot of cool hippies too. Um, we voted to legalize cannabis, and Colorado became the first principality in the world to have recreationally legal cannabis. And we voted for this in 2012, and it went into effect in 2014, in January. And after I voted for it, and I, I've always been against um, prohibition, um, it create prohibition creates a black market. Um, prohibit, like black markets are a negative externality, a negative side effect of society. If you have a bunch of people, a uh, society of people, and they agree to behave a certain way, some things are legal, some things are illegal, the problem is, is that the illegal part creates a black market. So if you say in your, um, if you say in your uh, society that um, flowers are illegal, but there are some people in your society that love flowers, and they're they're like maybe they keep a little like some little daisies or something, you know. Uh, in their home and they're like oh you know and it's all quiet and I, they, they go and they look at the daisies and they're like oh my god these are beautiful all right you've created a black market for flowers which means that markets are secured by violence and um the government the old theory is that the government has a monopoly on violence so when you have a a real market that is actually regulated correctly which is hard to find um you know evenly like mathematically you you get you know pe lots of people who could provide flowers and you get a nice exchange maybe you charge a little tax so that you can pay for roads or schools or breakfasts for kids when they go to class and things like that you know that's how those are the things you want to pay for a society the society needs that to be able to to successfully um, get by with what it's going to do uh, right so black markets um, anyway when you when you actually create a real market you take the violence out of it. All right. So that's why I voted for cannabis. I voted for legalizing cannabis because I was like the violence and so many things. I had smoked a little weed when I was in high school. After after I voted for it, I thought, huh, I wonder if cannabis can be good for me. I wonder if it could help me. I went and I got the I got ready. I got my uh, got my medical card, went down, purchased me some medical cannabis before it was recreational legally, legally. And I smoked that in 2012. And um my pain went away. So I have been a uh, daily cannabis smoker for about eight years now. And if I smoke in the evenings, you know, in a way that is relaxing for me, um, I can keep my inflammation and my pain at a zero. So the only way I was able to get up and start teaching um, college throughout this period of time and to put in the long hours and the discipline necessary was because I had um, a ally, a friend in cannabis that basically relieved the pain in the evening. And if I did that consistently, I would wake up in the morning pain-free. I could go through the day. I could stand on my feet. I could teach. I could basically be a functional member of society because I had the right, um, the right chemistry, the right, um, the right ally, uh, to, to, be, to make that work. So, you know, we're getting ready to legally uh, legalize cannabis federally. You know, one way or another, it's going to happen. Hopefully, um, I was a big. Oh, I was really hoping Yang would get in, and he was going to free everybody on April on four twenty. Um, you know, of twenty twenty one. Everybody from prison, everybody who's been locked up for cannabis, all this insanity around prohibition was going to be over. Um, hopefully, we'll get there <coughs> through some other mechanisms, maybe through Yang eventually. Um, Eventually, we're going to federally legalize cannabis. And what we're going to find is that the war against drugs, Nancy Reagan's war against drugs, just say no, all that stuff, which I grew up with, the D.A.R.E. program, all that indoctrination, one has, when one starts to uh, use cannabis uh, recreationally or medicinally, you have to get over so much bullshit in your own head and your own heart and your own mind. But what's cool about cannabis is that it is a... It is a um, a human friendly plant, so it's not a it's something that we have grown up with. The reason why it's so effective, and the reason why it was effective in treating my pain, was because um, it has um, cannabinoids, 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 cannabinoids in it. Now, cannabinoids, the, the body has a cannabinoid system that's used to regulate pain. 
and inflammation. So theoretically, if, you're, if you could like turn up the dial on your internal cannabinoid system, you would feel like you feel when you get high. You would feel like, whoa, everything is okay. Things are cool. Um, everything is good. Like everything is good in this, in this world that I live in. Um, they say, I mean, some of the scientists, because you can't quite do good science on it, a lot of good science out of Israel on this. They say that, you know, it's the modern stressful experience, not only emotional stress that we experience with our media, um, you know, channelizing us and pitting us against each other for the benefit of the people who run those things, honestly. We've got all that, but we also have um, environmental pressures. You know, we've got ke more chemicals in our environment. We've never had that before. We have more chemicals in our food. Um, it's a part of the way that we process and store food. It just has more, more crap in it, more stuff in it that didn't come as part of the natural process of the plants and the animals that make up our food. They, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't natural. We feed animals unnatural things. We raise them in unnatural ways, factory farming. All of these stresses, this is like, this is where karma is like a real thing. All of these, this, this is a bill that you have to pay. And we are paying that bill in our health, in our bodies, okay? This whole thing is a big old living system and it's interconnected, all right? And there's good science that's been coming out for since the 70s that supports this stuff. The, the real connections, that, that GCI stuff, that's, a, that's one example of, of one scientist really, um, you know, with a good support team looking at this very specific system, the heart, the brain, and, and back from that, backing into the truth that there are influences affecting it from outside and that system pushes influences back out, um, the, uh, back out into the world. And, there's a, and you can measure this stuff scientifically. So endocannabinoids. So the cannabinoid system in my body is compromised probably for a bunch of different reasons. But um, all of the ones that I just mentioned. So we have a cannabinoid system in our body, but it's depleted because of the stress of society, because of the stress of just the number of people and all of the mechanizations, the industrialization of our food supply, our medicine supply, our educational supply, all of it. It all, it all adds up, right? And we got to pay that bill. And we're paying it with our own health and our own well-being. So when I smoke cannabis and I, or when I eat cannabis and I do it in an environment that's relaxing and that's peaceful and that I can integrate the kind of what the experiences that I'm having there, what ends up happening is my natural cannabinoid system gets higher. I get, I, I feel relaxed and I feel more at peace. And that is why I'm able to go out and have a stressful job like teaching. Or uh, I do IT work as well, and I, that's pretty stressful work, IT. You just never know what's coming up next, what's going to break, who's going to need assistance. Um, it's a very empathic job uh, in a lot of ways. And at any time you're asked to be empathic a lot, it can deplete you. That's why the high burnout professions are, you know, nurses, um, EMTs, soldiers, doctors, um, teachers. These high burnout professions are there because they, the reason you burn out is because you're giving and giving and giving and your reservoir empties out. So how do you fill up your reservoir? Well, you come up with a strategy that works for your nervous system. Back to Maria Montessori. You, you come up with an environment that supports you and your nervous system, you, and that, that kind of holds it all together. Let's talk about God in this context for a minute. So um, his, history, Jesus, that Easter letter of that saint, I'll call him Saint Anthony Sir Social Sorcerer, that saint, that guy, 367. <sighs> Jesus, in what he did spiritually on the planet, is, it's unique because it's for an entire culture, it's for an entire Western culture, but it's the same pattern of thing that's been going on in India and in any place where humans evolve their nervous system for a very long time. When, um, when uh, Indian spiritual teachers and masters heard the story and read about Christ, um, read about Jesus, read the Bible, they said, 
things like, oh, this guy is a, this guy's like a self-realized master. Jesus is like a self-realized master. Self, meaning the God self, he realized it. We're one with, uh, know ye not that ye are gods. Uh, you know, these are the things that, you know, Jesus's ministry was about bringing the truth of that oneness to the people of his time and throughout time history of the church. So you've got Jesus and you've got his ministry. Then you've got the scattering. You've got the um, the, the the Jerusalem falls a couple hundred years later. Uh, the Roman Empire takes over. Um, the, the version of Christianity that we have now is adapted for the nervous systems of the people of our time. Did you know that there are over 23,000 forms of Christianity in America today? More than that. And And a common feature of a lot of these forms of Christianity, 23,000, is that they're the only way. They're the only one. Their particular understanding, their particular way of looking at things is the only way that it can be, right? This is a um, an isolationist kind of view, and the solution to this kind of stuff is what's called ecumenical, or the bridging of the gaps between people. Now, the, the key is you don't want to water down your particular religion and your particular practice, but what you do want to do is exist in harmony with the people around you. Why? Because I can't make a GoPro. I, I don't have the skills. I am standing on the shoulders of a lot of technology and a lot of craft and art that, that people have put together to produce this particular device, okay? It's standing on the shoulders of 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 people that have been discovering stuff going back to fire in the wheel all the way to this transmission medium, okay? And um, we need each other. We need each other globally. There's too many of us here now, billions of us here. We can't survive without industrial level agriculture, but we could get smarter about it. You know, we could we could do it better. Um, you know, just supporting all these people is is a really big deal. All right, so 23,000 forms of Christian or 23,000 plus forms of Christianity in America. So there's this real need for people to have a strong practice, clearly. Um, and what we do naturally when given the freedom to do it is we produce our own version of it. This room, this broadcast represents my version of religion, of for me, okay? All my cards on the table. I have a 501c3. That is the federal tax designation for a church that protects what I'm doing here. This is protected under the First Amendment, meaning I... That, that agreement that we made that people can say things, um, not without consequences, but they're free to say them, all right? They can't be legally stopped from saying something. That's important. Um, we have to balance that ability to communicate with the entire world with our own need to be very clear and very centered and very focused in our own life about what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, basically how we're practicing. What's practice? Practice is running the nervous system through a routine in order to potentially, hopefully, maybe achieve some state of consciousness. You go into meditation and you achieve a calmer, more peaceful state of consciousness. You go into prayer and you achieve a connection in your own neurology with the divine. And you draw inspiration from that, okay? These are important functions for a soul. When I say soul, what I mean is, the collection of electrical activity uh, that persists in the body. Something like that would be my definition of it, right? We all have one in my, in my estimation, and everybody on the planet, as far as I can tell, needs a spiritual practice. Spiritual. Um, needs an electromagnetic pra practice, needs a practice with their nervous system to bring their nervous system forward and bring forward the things that are trying to evolve within the nervous system. In the, Hindu, in the Hindu understanding of things, they have these things, forest rishis. The, the forest rishis are the forest saints, are the holy men and women who would go into nature in India, in ancient India, and they would just observe nature. And when they would observe their own bodies, they would observe their own minds. And when they, they listened to their bodies, they would hear these sounds, these um, bindu, or these bijan sounds, these, these, these core sounds up and down the, the human nervous system. Modern science says these sounds and the places that they place them are associated with the organs and the hormonal system that's there. So you might have, a, then they give them the name chakras. Chakra means wheel or turning wheel. So a chakra and a healthy chakra is a wheel that turns from the inside. Think of your, think of the flow of energy through this 
electrical cord, the extension cord, essentially that is your, uh, your spine, right? The extension cord, the living extension cord, it's plugged into your brain, it's plugged into your heart, but it's also plugged into every part of your body. The reason I can move my fingers out there is because my brain is sending a signal out to, through an electrical pathway out to my fingers and it's manipulating it. So we are electricity. We are the integration of electricity and of matter. Um, we are dancing matter, okay? That it is, it is animated matter. When you say something is spiritual, what I think you're, what I think a way of saying it is, is it what it is? Is it's it's potent with electricity, all right? It is a it is an electrical potential that has the ability to inspire, 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 in uh, drawing in the spirit. The breath is connected to the spirit. What if what we're talking about with spirit is just electricity? That is what uh, Paramahansa Yogananda said. He said, I was talking to one of his monks um, that live out in uh, San Diego, and he was saying, I was talking about some of these ideas about our electricity and how the, um, a chip, an electrical chip, like the chips that are in this camera, like the chips that are in the device you're using to play this back, what they are is they're crystalline forms of their grids, grids of energy, just energy um, channeled into a pattern, all right? Yogananda called electricity unconscious God. Yogananda called God conscious electricity. So in Yogananda's Hindu Indian approach to enlightenment or realization, God realization, it is a part of it is a um, flooding of the electrical system with energy. Um, a Kundalini system, a series of chakras filled with energy boiling over, uh, you know, in harmony with the carrier wave, maybe, of the divine. The divine. What if the divine, or Aglista, a part of the divine, was just the electromagnetic spectrum? What if it was just all of the electricity in our... It's certainly one of the most interesting things. When something doesn't have electricity in it, it's dead. When you see a dead body, like a, a pet or an animal maybe that has passed on, the electrical nature has stopped. And because the electrical nature has stopped, the, all those cells will go back in and they will turn back into atoms. And if you um, bury a beloved friend like that in, a, in your yard or something, um, the mushrooms and the mycelial networks will decompose that body back. And that ex those exact same atoms that are in that body will become trees and become flowers. So we're in a continuous interaction with the environment and the pattern of information for how to make a human is very strong because the estimates are 17 percent of our body is replaced every day that is my arm 17 that is like the weight of my arm that's the amount of material that'll leave my body and become um, part of the natural system and i will also need to replace that material every day so the flowers and the the trees with their beautiful scents and fragrances and all this, these are, this is my body. That's my body. It's, I'm breathing it in. Those little molecules are going to become part of me. Okay. And then I'm going to breathe out. And part of me is leaving. Part of the actual atoms are leaving my body. Um, I forget the name of the YouTube video. I'll try to credit it uh, somewhere in the, in the credits. Uh, there was this really cool guy. Um, he was talking about um, just the, this beautiful science. And uh, I think it was a 99% video. Um, I'll try to find that one. He talks about the, um, oh, he talks about this beautiful gravity well in our universe. It's like a, it's like a fold in the gravity space of, of the universe. And what it is, is it's kind of like a, a collider for stars. So if you have, this is his point, but if you have stars like in the natural universe, they're spread out over large areas, right? Not a lot of interaction. So what happens is, imagine the stars are like marbles and the marbles are running down this, this, uh, this trough kind of. And as the marbles run down this trough, they, they interact and they hit each other and they, they bump into each other. And it's that bumping into each other and the colliding and the explosion and the, the recombination of material that gives us the complexity of matter that we need in order to have things like oxygen. Oxygen is a complex atom that is only produced through the interaction of stars. And there wasn't any oxygen in the early universe. Um, I know it's all hard to see, but you can see kind of the Big Bang on outward over there on the wall. And uh, that, that Big Bang image there 
starts with the Big Bang, which is, of course, a controversial kind of thing. I know there's some scientists who don't think, don't jive with that, but um, it explains some of the features that we see experimentally in the world when you're talking about the the heat radiation at the edge of the universe and how you see it. Um, science is the story of instruments. So science could catch up to the Hindus and their Vedic texts if you had some kind of chakra instrument, right? If you had something that could detect these energies or if not the raw energy, then the harmonic energy that's going on. Um, there is a harmonic communication between things. Okay, we opened a lot of boxes there. God and electricity. Okay, so electricity in the spine might be God realization, uh, an, an empowerment, uh, like a, an, an embodied realization of the God self inside. Kundalini awakening um, to one way of looking at it. We're on a pirate ship, my friends. This particular pirate ship flies a flag. And I've got this flag out here the Joe Rogan experience. And the reason why I have this, this flag is because Joe Rogan has um, a big inspiration for me. Love the guy. I've listened to for years from about 2012 till about 2018. I listened to every episode. Then the episodes, they got to be a lot more episodes. And I, I couldn't keep up. So I, I, I've done, I do a lot of them and I listen to a lot of them. I enjoy them quite a bit. What I really like about Joe is, is what we're doing here. It's a long form discussion. What I love about Joe is that he, um, uh, he opens the box and what he's, what he's credited with, with the intellectual dark web and all these other people that have been inspired by him, he's credited with basically asking a lot of questions. Uh, thinking in public is the way that I've described it before. He's willing to think and he's willing to assess and he's willing to um, kind of um, weigh things and uh, consider the alternatives and the implications of these kinds of things. And he's able, when he, when he does all of this stuff, when, he's, when he does all of this, what he's doing is he is demonstrating learning. And that's why I love him as a teacher. Because if you are open to having new experiences, you can learn and acquire new things. If you define true learning as the application of your nervous system, um, then that's very important. Um, let's take a detour and let's talk about tying your shoes. So you're tying your shoes, right? Uh, you, if you're an adult today, you can probably tie your shoes. Think about what it was like before you knew how to tie your shoes. Think about it before what it was like when you were born and you couldn't even use your arms. Think about what was necessary to get from the point where you're like, ah, to the point where you could move your hands, to the point where you could organize your thinking, to the point where you could um, control your physical body, you know, have the dexterity to do this. It's the same way you learn anything. Like you're playing guitar and you have to learn the muscle coordination. You're playing piano. You have to learn the, the placement of all the different keys. Um, you're singing. You have, to, you have to learn how to control your vocal cords and uh, th these are all nervous system experiences, okay? Um, there's this woman named Carol Dweck, and she wrote a book called Mindset. And if you're a teacher in America, you've heard of this book, because this stuff's being taught to kindergartners, it's being taught to first graders, second graders. The growth mindset is big, because it is, and it's been big for about a decade. It's big because it is the neurology of learning. And the growth mindset separates things into two categories. You've got growth mindset, and you've got fixed mindset. And mindset is the right word for it because it's just an approach. If you are in the mindset that is aware of process, you are in the growth mindset. If you're in a mindset that's aware of product only, you're in the fixed mindset, okay? Let me, let me kind of unpack that a little bit. So I'm, trying, I'm a little toddler and I'm trying to learn how to tie my shoes. When I, when I do the work of tying my shoes, I am making attempts. I might attempt to put on my shoes for the first time. I might attempt to tie them. Now you're not gonna tie them perfectly the first time. What you're gonna do is you're gonna make a little mistake, you're gonna tie it wrong, you're gonna tie a knot, maybe you can't even manipulate the laces properly, right? That's why we invented like Velcro and kids Velcro and kids shoes don't have laces, you know, little baby shoes and stuff, at least not that they tie. You have to, to learn something, you have to take many, many, many approaches. To do that 
and be aware that you're in the process of doing that, you have to be in an environment that supports it. Usually, for a young person like that, and in the environment is another person. So an older brother and sister, a twin, someone else who could, maybe the same age isn't the right thing, but like maybe just someone who's older and a little bit like a parent uh, who could who could look over. So let's say I'm watching a child tie their shoes and I'm trying to encourage them. I'm like, oh, there you go, you got it. Uh, you're, you're tying it. Oh, you didn't do it quite right. That's okay. Nobody knows how to tie their shoes the first time. You've got to you've got to basically continue to do that. You've got to continue to make attempts. Do you hear my encouragement? Yeah, and I'm encouraging them. And what I'm saying is, value the process. There's value in the process. You don't get to the product, the the tied shoe, without a lot of process involved. All right. That's one. That's one thing. Let's say that kid learns how to tie their shoes. The takeaway for them might be. Wow, I learned how to tie my shoes and it took a long time and it took a lot of diligent effort for me to figure out how that worked. But in the end, I learned how to tie those shoes. All right, let's look at fixed mindset. Let's say that you're a child now and you don't have anyone around. Let's say you're on your own, okay? Let's say you are learning how to tie your shoes and it's frustrating and you've got to do it and perhaps there's some necessity around you doing it. So there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of force, there's a, a lot of... Um, Let's just say you're in a neutral environment, but you could also be in a negative environment where someone is like, oh, you, you dumb shit. You don't know how to tie your shoes. Oh, you're so stupid. You're never going to learn how to tie your shoes. Why do you even bother? Why do you even bother doing all this stuff? You hear what I'm doing? It's very negative and it's very much um, working against the process, right? A child in this environment, as the book Mindset, this is some of the theory that's in it, a, a child in this environment will, out of necessity, ultimately have to tie their shoes. They will learn how to do it. But what they're not, but, be, but because they didn't have a connection, they weren't paying attention to the process, they might come away with a, a, a fixed understanding. Uh, the fixed understanding is, I know how to tie my shoes, it's done. So you, by not remembering the process, what, what ends up happening is you end up gluing to the result. And we have this bad way of thinking that somehow some people are naturally better at things than other people. That guy, he's just great at basketball. That lady, she's just wonderful at math. That kid, he's just fantastic at speaking. The reason why any of those people are good at any of those things is because they had lots of attempts. There was a long process involved in them getting to the point where that was a reality for them. But we tend to, in the fixed mindset, we tend to cut out process and just go for product. Oh, it's a fantastic, he's just a naturally gifted um, uh, soccer player, football player, rugby player. Um, that naturally gifted rugby player, no matter what their physical body is, imagine if they never learned anything. Imagine if they never learned how to walk. Imagine if they never learned how to tie their shoes. Imagine if they never learned how to speak. Do you think that person without any of that training is gonna be a great rugby player or anybody else? No, of course not. It's gonna require lots and lots and lots of attempts. So a Tecoria 1.0 environment, lots of attempts. Uh, an environment that encourages lots of activity. This is all you need to learn anything, I swear to God. Uh, college professor, I know, I, I taught, I'm a, when I said I was a special college professor, what I meant is that I would teach five classes a month, five different classes a month. And I have, there's 12 months in the year. We never took a summer off. There's no summers in this program I was in. We got two weeks off at Christmas, basically. And um, in this environment, you know, I have seen these things called curriculum vitaes. Like uh, it's the list of all the things that, uh, like all the classes that a teacher has taught. I've seen curriculum vitaes for people at Ivy League schools and they've got like three classes on there. Like, oh my God, if I taught three classes over and over and over again, I could get amazing at teaching that class, right? Um, uh, I taught five different classes uh, every month and we had one month semesters and I did this for um, four plus years. I basically got my 10,000 hours like that in teaching. So I spent, and these were, you know, these were not normal classes. <laughs> I would have eight hours per class per week. So when I was teaching five classes, that's 45 hours of me standing in front of the room, talking and teaching to people for that entire 45 hours. That's no prep, that's no grading, that's no um, reading the books, uh, getting ready for it. And with all the variety, there was so much of that to do. Long story short. I worked my ass off as a teacher and I'm, I was really good at teaching. And I was really good at keeping us on, I think, keeping us on track to get to the real goal of any one of these trade programs that I was in. 
one of the schools I was teaching at, um, we, we had IT, which was a broad degree in technology. And I taught like 80, 90 plus percent of that, of that course. So normally a college professor teaches one class, but there isn't a lot of integration between the other classes. I would teach a whole program. 80% plus of a program. So I had to tie in this concept to this concept to this concept to this concept to this concept. And in a technical understanding, that might be computer repair, that might be network engineering, that might be database engineering or database or in programming. Um, it might be electronics and electronic theory. So just imagine tying all of those things together. Oh, it's so much fun. It's such a joy to get to lead um, students through this, this long process. Joe Rogan, by learning out loud in public, is engaging in a growth mindset. He's taking attempts. He also talks a lot about taking attempts. He talks about um, some of the process, some of the things that he has mastered and is approaching mastery, like archery and things like that. And you can watch him on TV on different programs, like going out and hunting, and uh, you know, taking down animals and stuff. And um, it's a, it requires a lot of attempts. You need the right environment to make those attempts. So again, my invitation to you is to create your own environment, however it, it, it occurs to you to do it. Get creative and, in, and make sure that that environment supports you. Is, uh, this, this room looks like an awesome kindergarten classroom because there's stations. I've got, I've got stations over here for geometry. I've got stations over here for technology, uh, for art. Um, these, are the, this is, uh, these are images from Flaming Lips concerts. Have you ever been to a Flaming Lips concert? It's like a universe church. Um, this guy named Matthew Fox, he's a, um, a theologian, a Christian theologian. and He would create these things called cosmic raves, which were like an evolved form of worship of the divine, which tried to involve all of the elements and sound and dancing and light. That's, like what it, that's what it's like to go to a Flaming Lips concert. You know, those guys are shamans. Shaman. Someone who can navigate the electromagnetic spectrum as it, you know, in their consciousness. Maybe our consciousness is what part of the electromagnetic spectrum we're tuned into, right? So I use that term broadly to describe um, a lot of different people. Um, the, basically the wizards out there who can take a group of people and take them into another state of consciousness. These are the, this is what our art, this is what art is about. This is what artistry is about, okay? Tecorio is a word that I made up. It comes from three words, techne, core, and creo. Techne is a Greek word. It means art or craft. Core is, a, um, is the same word as the French word core for heart. Uh, that, that, is, that is for heart. And then creo is to create. Like a credo, you make a credo and it's like a, it's a creation kind of story, right? So tecorio, create the art of the heart. That is all learning is. Let's imagine for a second that one could tune into the source of everything inside their nervous system and they have the right environment around them so they could structurally bring that forward in, in incremental realistic steps until they are living that truth. That is what I call heaven. If everybody was able to bring forward their connection to the divine, the, the divine, the, the great electromagnetic field, right? Uh, there's so many ways you can say it. Don't get hung up on my words. Go with what I'm trying to, go with what I'm pointing to, not what I'm saying, okay? Like, make the jump. The, uh, if, if, we, if everybody was coming from that place, this would be heaven. This dimension would be heaven. And our ways of relating to each other would be amazing. What does this require? This requires an understanding of what we are, that we each need a structure, like an exoskeleton around us, like in the way that Iron Man puts on that suit and he can fly around and, you know, blast things and blow shit up. We need like an exosuit for our nervous system, specifically for God inside of our nervous system so that we can interact and, and be in this world in very powerful ways. Iron Man's suit gives one man with his in, impulse, in the end, I think he, spoiler alert, I think he saves the universe, right? All of it. <laughs> kind of a Christ metaphor, I would have to say. And uh, in any event, the um, exoskeleton that we require now as a culture is an evolution of our classroom. And we need a classroom per person. This is why I wanted, this is why I want AI, a general purpose AI. Can you imagine how cool it would be if I had a general purpose AI that helped me set this up, that edited this file for me, that does all of the work necessary to broadcast our pirate ship out into international waters? It would be unbelievably cool. 
how much even cooler would it be if someone had like a, you know, handed me a, you know, a little floating robot that was like, and it like followed me around as a child and was looking at me the whole time and was like, okay, this guy, Paul, man, he's really good with language. Let's make sure he knows a couple different ones. I see he's got a, a propensity for science here. Let's make sure that he has the resources for science. How cool would it be if that AI was plugged into some kind of resource grid or, you know, had access to resources and it could basically say, oh, look, we've got a young person here who's really into science. Let's make sure that they have access to the telescopes. Let's make sure they have access to the particle accelerators. Let's make sure that they have access to all the electronics that they need in order to develop the wisdom that is going on inside of there. And their family doesn't have to pay for that. That's stupid. This is going to be societal resources. Imagine if all of those AIs were transparent, like a blockchain, and all of their decisions were put into a giant equation, and you could basically look at a society and say, all right, what's the level of how we doing with managing all of our people? It's a fantasy, I know, but it's a cool science fiction story. You're welcome to write that story if you want. Go ahead, run with that shit. Um, the more that people understand that story about um, the accurate application of resources, intelligently distributed through by a common like and and controlled by a common blockchain so that everybody could actually see it and it was transparent it means that it would be non-corruptible uh theoretically or at least that would be a good a good hedge against corruption my man joe rogan all right this is a funny little candle this is like saint rogan joe his name is joseph my middle name is joseph we're gonna light this candle and this candle represents the learner within all of us, okay? The part of us that can, look at his funny, confused face. Isn't that hilarious? He's like, <laughs> so funny. He's got this little book here. Love it. We're talking about this book, Joe. We're gonna talk about this book in just a second. This is a, this could be a, a prayer, not to a person, because what, what's the point of that? But how about a prayer to a principal? The principle is we can learn, we can grow. And the reason I think Joe is so popular is because he um, goes through rites of passage in public. He thinks in public, but he also develops and learns in public. One of my favorite things and the thing that really endeared, endeared, me, um, endeared me to Joe early on is he's not afraid to talk about his spiritual experiences. Um, early on in his podcast, I got in in 2012, he would talk about God, essentially. Those are my words. He, he always describes it as like a, uh, the best place I ever heard him describe it uh, was in like a September 2013 um, thing on Fitz Dog Radio. His, his friend, Greg Fitzsimmons, had him on his podcast. Joe doesn't talk about it on his podcast as much, but he talked about it on this other one. And he talks about, um, you can basically go to Fitz Dog Radio. Podcasts are RSS feeds. RSS feeds are a protocol for communication. And uh, this protocol for communication, it's uh, the RSS uh, 2.0 standard had this thing called an enclosure tag. Enclosure tags are basically like, here's some news, here's some text, but here's a reference to an MP3 file. You can go to Fitzdog Radio, you can pull up their RSS feed, do a search for Rogan. There is a link to the MP3 file and that's how you can download it. I can probably put up a link for you or something. Um, nah, let me not do that because quite frankly, this is a great podcast for 2033. Uh, 2033, my target audience is floating in little pods uh, around an asteroid belt and it's some kind of like f mining, you know, colony with like each family is in like a space RV you know, a recreational vehicle for like a whole family to live in. And they're out there mining, you know, atoms out of... Anyway, it's so funny because these things require head-mounted displays in order to uh, in order to really play them back properly. And uh, that's not going to be popular for a while. So I pretty much assume that this podcast, this this 3D podcast that I'm doing here, is, uh, is going into the can until about 2033. But it'll be important from a historical perspective to understand how all of this shit went down. So that's why I'm making this. Eh, who knows, maybe I'll find some other people along the way who are interested in these kinds of ideas, who want to talk about them and grok about them and, you know, spread them. So Joe is going through, um, what do we do here? Um, the principle that we can all learn, the principle that we can all grow, and quite frankly, the the, a rite of passage is a trans, is a, is a, trend, a boundary transition from one state of development to another. Um, a rite of passage for a caterpillar is becoming a butterfly, right? It's got the cocoon, it goes to sleep, it comes out a butterfly, something new. We do this psychologically. 
psychologically we need to move from one state to another state. Um, when we do that and we have help, because the psychology isn't physical, if our community rallies around us and says, oh, young man, you're getting ready to become, you're going from a young man to a full man. You're going to be, now once you make this boundary transition, you can marry, you can um, own property, you can, um, you know, do all of the, you know, maybe we afford you certain rights when you, when you transition this kind of thing. We don't have good rites of passage. And Joe goes through certain rites of passage in public. And what I mean by that is that he openly describes his experience of God in that Fitz Dog Radio um, episode. He talks about it like a, like a geometry that can speak to you, um, a state of consciousness that he's in where he, he knows love to be the primary vibratory signature of the world. Um, it's all made of love. He's described it in so many different ways. But what I love about it is that he, when he describes it, he describes it as a um, one state of consciousness, maybe even just a few seconds of consciousness that permanently change the way he looks at things. That is a spiritual opening, okay? That is a nervous system experience that changes the way that you look at the world. And it's so cool because Joe will like have all these scientists and artists and comedians and friends and all these people on and he'll talk to them about it and he brings it up all the time. And that is how I think you identify someone who has had a spiritual opening is they're like, I had this experience one time and I'm trying to understand what it is. That's what happened to me when I was 16. That's what happened to Joe back in the day. He experienced that through um, smoking DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Um, he'll tell you all about it. It's so funny. It's one of the memes around Joe is just like how long it takes him to talk about DMT. If you look at the comments on any of his videos, there's always somebody who's like three minutes, four seconds, and they put a link to the first time he brings it up. Um, why that's so important is because everybody goes through rites of passage. All humans do. And if we don't have strong community that gathers around us and, and shepherds us through that transition, we suffer. Joe has created a kind of rite of passage framework for young people. And I'll tell you how this, I'll tell you how I got to this. So voted to legalize cannabis in Colorado, first place in the world where it's recreationally legal, starts in January of 2014. Just so happens that I moved to Evergreen, Colorado, where I live now, right before that. And I got a job at this trade school in town down in Denver. And I started that job in January of 2014. What also started in January 2014 was cannabis legalization. Almost, not all of my students, but a significant percentage of my students started experimenting with cannabis that month. And that was the first month that I, um, that I was there with them. That was the first month that we were in our classroom. Um, let me, let's have some fun here. Let's have a little bit of fun with, uh, with, this, uh, with some stuff. Let's do this. Uh, let me get, let me pull this up real quick. All right, I'm gonna go to my Chrome here. Pardon me for my search. Um, let's pull up some photos that I've got here and I'm gonna go to my albums. And I'm gonna go to this one. All right. And this one is not the one I'm looking for, sorry. Um, I, have a, I have a set of images that are in here that show some of my classrooms, okay? I'm just gonna give you an example, a couple of examples here of, uh, let's see here. Okay, so this is my first, this is my first day in, in class. These are some of my students. Um, I guess, uh, Hey guys, how's it going? I'm not going to give you any of their names or anything like that. I'm just going to show you an example of this classroom that we started out in. Uh, many of these students went on to graduate. Uh, many of them went on to have really wonderful careers. Um, it, see, we see what's happening here. You got a bunch of students that are sitting in rows. Okay, you've got a classroom that is dark. The overhead lights are from the 1960s. Um, you can, if you're in a classroom and you're a teacher and you're wondering if the fluorescent lights are messing with you. What you do is you turn on a video on your camera. Um, this at least worked a couple years ago. It probably still does. Take the, take the video and go like this 
and record the, the frequency of light that's coming out of the ceiling. If you, if you play back that video and you see a lot of jumping, what it might mean is that you have an older style of fluorescent light that pulses about once every 30, like uh, in, in, the, in the very short range, like one uh, 30th of a second, pulse, 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 pulse. The eye can't see it except when you're moving. You, can, you might be able to see like a little, a little change in it. That frequency of light will affect the nervous system and that effect on the nervous system will be profoundly negative. When I, when I had those lights on in that room and I tested them, I was like, oh shit, these are the old ones. My students after about 30 minutes wanted to kill me if I was talking like this to them. We've probably been going for more than an hour here. They would have like thrown me out. Uh, in this in this process, right? Um, the, the 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 newer kind of fluorescent lights are twenty thousand times a second. So they have a different kind of um, electrical device that actually does the pulsing. I forget the name of it. It's called a it's called ballast, I think. And uh, that ballast, it, it's a nicer version of it. And when it's pulsing twenty thousand times a second, it's not as bad. Um, it's not as good as uh, as like a, a natural incandescent light. This kind, of, this kind of a light here, it's a more expensive kind of light, but it's a heat-based light. Electricity is moving through a filament. The filament resists it. When that electrical current goes through and there's resistance, that resistance turns into heat and light. That's what a light bulb is. It holds it up like this. Um, the, uh, I just, the other things I taught in college, I taught, I taught technical school. I also taught business, taught a piece of the business program, and project management. The other, the other kinds of things that were taught in this room where I was in were um, medical. So people were learning how to become phlebotomists and uh, become uh, medical assistants. So practical work, all these kids, all these students, they were um, trying to learn how to, um, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? They were trying to learn how to become IT people, okay? Now, this is, I would call this a Tecorio 0.2 maybe environment. Uh, the problem is they're all in rows, they're all staring at the same kinds of screens. What you don't see, which is the really bad part of this, is that they're, what they're doing is they're in simulators. There's like, they're like in a software simulator and their software simulator is trying to um, show like how to, do, how to use a technical system, but, it's, but you're not actually getting to touch the technical system. It's not a bunch of cables and, and you know, like a, like a physical uh, thing that you can like pick up and like lay your hands on. Maria Montessori would say, this is preparation for learning. This is where you might learn abstract knowledge, but it's not real until you actually have to like do something with your physical hands, plug it in. That's where confidence comes in, is actually just messing around with things, uh, messing around with them. So college professor giving you a little bit of advice. Uh, you don't need, um, if this is the kind of environment that you're in, you're gonna get a much better education from just goofing around with this kind of stuff, grabbing a book, doing it yourself, applying the knowledge. If you're in a really good classroom, hopefully that's, that's, what's, gonna be, that's what's gonna be going on, is you're gonna be applying it. So this is, the, uh, this is my classroom. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one day. You can kind of see what's going on in my classroom here. Here's another group of students. And uh, what we're doing in this classroom is we're playing rock band. Now that might sound like a frivolous activity, but it was a reward for some mathematics. This is a class and we were focused on mathematics and learning mathematics. And we were actually singing some Beatles songs as we did this. So everybody got a chance to kind of perform and, uh, and do some pretty cool work here. Um, this is us actually, this is us in the classroom. So you can see I've got, you can see some of the, some of the props that I have are the same. You, these are my, uh, my chairs that I would use. So I would, when I was teaching class, I'd have people like sit around in a circle and I'd have them discuss and I'd have them, basically it was like a kindergarten classroom. It was, a, it was a classroom where there was a high, it was high touch and there was high interactivity. And what we were trying to do was we were trying to, um, what's the word? So try to create an environment where you'd have to apply your knowledge, where you would have to actually do the thing that you were trying to do. Get us out of the theoretical, get us into the practical. Um, one of the things that I did is I would teach technology, and I'd even teach this to some of the, um, some of the uh, nursing students and some of the medical students. Um, the, uh, the, the, there was this problem that I, would, that I would constantly run into, and the problem was this. The problem was um, I would ask them, you know, I'd pull out my cell phone and I'd say, hey, does anyone know how the cell phone works? And we would, I would get, the, get a whole class of maybe 20 people and I'd get every idea that they were willing to share with me out at once. And when they would share all of these ideas, 
they would, it would basically, you could sort of add them up and piece them together and you might understand some aspect. And there is a, you know, people would be like, you know, oh, how does it work? How does this work? It's like, oh, it's a computer. And I'd be like, who knows how to use a computer? And people are like, yeah, yeah, I know how to use a computer. And I'd be like, okay, cool. What do you do on a computer? And people would be like, you go online. And I'd be like, great, what's online? And they were like, Facebook. And I'd be like, wait a minute. There's, you know, there's this web that's out there and they're like, yeah, it's not really online. Facebook is really online. What was happening is over and over again, students would be on a platform. So they would, their, their understanding of technology would be mediated by a set of tools. But when you take away the tools and you start taking away the layers of technology, what happens is you get down to the bare metal. And the bare metal turns out to be this world, this reality, okay? The, the, the objects and the things that are in this room that don't have anything to do with technology are the same kinds of atoms and the same kinds of material that can be arranged into complex structures. And those complex structures can, can basically provide a platform for this, um, uh, the expression that is our technology. So the fact that we get an image on this screen, right? You've got materials that are lighting up in one of three colors, red, green, blue. We have to understand that color is, is, a, is a com in our eyes because we have three kinds of cells, red, green, blue cells that receive the light. For our biology, light has to do with, um, you know, how much of each one of those you have. So if you have a red light and you have a blue light, and you mix those together, you get purple light. And that's what, when you're talking about a screen monitor like this, you're talking about you know, tens of thousands of different color options that we can pull together to be able to, uh, to make that happen. So long story short, um, basically when I have it on my cell phone, we get to the point where some student would throw up their hands and say, I'd say, how does this cell phone work? And they'd say, magic. And I'd say, well, it is magic if you mean that the fundamental forces of our universe are so powerful and so flexible, the physics of our world is so cool that it can be manipulated into a creation. That is techne. The Greek word for craft or art is the manipulation of basic things into something cool. Think of basket weaving or making a potter, a piece of pottery or something like that. When you're, when you're manipulating and you're weaving, you make a... Um, you make something out of this, all right? That's techne. Uh, techne is the uh, word that our, our technology comes from. And there is an unbroken chain between our advanced cellular cell phone technology and the first people that discovered how fire worked. You can, you can connect these two. If you wanna have a really fun time, uh, smoke a little grass, and uh, look at an old um, thing from the 70s and the early 80s by uh, James Burke. It's called Connections. You have to smoke a little grass because, quite frankly, it's a little dated. So being a little high is going to be a good experience for you <laughs> to, to go back and experience, you know, filming in the early 1980s. Because on first glance, you're going to be like, this stuff's retarded. <laughs> retarded. Um, retard is a French word. It means slow. Okay. We, uh, I grew up. And I grew up in a time when that word was used uh, openly and wonderfully, and wonderfully, and great. Um, je suis retardé, je suis en retard, means I am slow. And we have this tendency, the word police want to take every word away. They want to take uh, every expression away. And uh, it's a big red flag, man. It's a big red flag. All my friends in uh, 2033 that are floating in the asteroid belt that are mining, they probably have very little use for your mind control and societal control through uh, shaming and through excising people out of the social structure. Um, God, I'm on, a, I'm on a totally on a side tangent here, but whatever. We open the box. Let's open the box. Uh, when you shut someone down, when you say um, you're an actor in the 1950s and someone says, hey, you're a communist. It's like, I'm not a communist. Be like, you are, Pinko. You're a communist. You're out. No more work. You're techne. Your creative artistic expression has been interrupted by a societal ill, a societal virus, basically. The, the, the boogeyman that was communism and the need to extract that boogeyman is a very ancient uh, thing. In our brains, we have a system that records pain and it's small. We have another system that records social connection and it's large. That 
that system that records social connection basically says if you're isolated from other people, if you're removed from other people, if you're thrown out of the group, if you're shamed, if you're excommunicated, thrown out, that is more painful to us than anything. We have to come to the understanding as humans that we are all here contributing to the field of experience and no one gets thrown out. We, no one gets thrown out, man. You can't throw people out of the system. It's a bad idea. It's terrible. And it causes black markets of humans. Now you've got people that can't participate in systems. And because they can't participate in systems, they're going to go create their own craziness over here. And that craziness is going to be in opposition to yours. Why? We have to figure out ways to bring everybody, all humanity, to the table and get everyone to understand that, like, we all, we need each other. We need all of us. We need everyone to contribute to the greatness of humanity. One humanity with many different flavors, right? Many different environments, religions, societies, families, groups that are in, in, a, in a protocol, a healthy protocol with each other. So... You've got this environment, you've got your Tecorio. Uh, this is my lab, right? And in it, I develop my nervous system. I communicate my ideas. I, I, do, I, I do my learning. I do my deep learning, and then I refine that learning, and then I broadcast that learning out to you guys. And that's what you've been hearing for the last bit of time. Um, Joe Rogan, and the reason why this thing is a pirate ship, another French word, uh, la fenêtre. It means, la fenêtre is the window. Uh, there's this word, uh, fenestration, comes from the French word for window. Uh, uh, defen to defenestrate something is to throw it out, to throw it out the window. We are defenestrating so many people in our society so unnecessarily because we need every single one of them. And what we need is a, an understanding that society is a conversation. It's a dialogue, okay? The problem with our current tools like Twitter it's a bad tool because I can get on Twitter right now and I can go, hey world, what's going on? The sky is blue. And the whole world hears me. That is an unnatural amount of communicative power. It's not necessary. I don't need to communicate to the whole world all the time, okay? Mostly, I probably got a small group of people until 2033 when this thing takes off that, uh, that are listening to me and that's my own little group, all right? Some scientists, some social scientists connected with Google built some of these tools into Google Plus, which isn't around anymore. Google Plus was a social network way ahead of its time because it was based on science. Inside Google Plus, I could create a circle and I could have this, if it existed, this is be where I would be posting it, okay? This is where I could have a conversation. If somebody comes in and they are malevolent, I can kick them out of my group. I can, I can, I can push them out, their voice is no longer heard. That is a biological metaphor. If my, if my heart, uh, the tissues of my heart recognize that they're, uh, tissues are cells. Cells are little autonomous um, creations that are running a protocol that interact with the other cells. If my heart decides there's a cell in here that doesn't belong, it can, it can get rid of this. It can push it out. The same way your skin, if you get a uh, splinter in your skin, your skin will push it out over time, right? That is a biological metaphor. We need this. We need a way to have groups of humans and then push someone out, but don't, but they can go be with someone else. Maybe they can even still listen to the group. Maybe they can, they can, it's like a one-way mirror so that you, they can, they can hear our conversation and they can be like, God dang it, these people have this conversation with it, but they aren't able to participate in the conversation. That might be a, the right kind of social thing you want to do, but you can't erase people, and Twitter is intentionally not developing the tools. Get off of Twitter, everybody. Get off of the megaphone that, I'm talking and the whole world can hear. Guess what that is? It's a cacophony, all right? We need littler groups. We need conversations that only go so far. If I stand on my front porch and I yell my ideas at the top of my lungs, there might be 12 people in my neighborhood that can hear me. Probably less, because it's the middle of the day. Like that is, that is very, very different than me being able to say something here and potentially every human on the planet that's not getting blocked from my stuff can hear it. That's why this thing is a pirate ship. The defenest, we defenestrate people, we throw them out, okay? I am self-defenestrating. This pirate ship 
is built on a series of technologies, okay? You can get this video, you're probably watching it on YouTube or some other big platform, but you can go back to my website. My website can be hosted anywhere on the earth, all right? On my website, you can download the raw file, okay? I'm giving you the 200 gigabyte file that is the original high definition, uncompressed version of this so that you can play it back in VR. And I wanna show you something here. All right, this is, a, this is a, the video, the first video that I sent out, and this is the one you're watching here is the second one. So I just want you to see this for a second. All right, this world, this world that I'm in is an entire world. Now, if I was watching me, Reverend Paul here, on this TV, look at this. It's a little tiny screen, and you have to look in through the screen into this world. It's a window. Every time, every time we create, let's see if I can put myself in this frame here. Here we go. Every time we create a frame, every time we do some techne, some technology, every time we, we create a stage, this stage is a 16 by nine window. That, that's probably how you're seeing it. You can also play this video back and you can play it back on a cell phone. And when you play it back on a cell phone, you can like, you can move it around. And when you move it around, you sort of get the sense of it being uh, in an environment, that there be, there's an environment around it. To really take it to the next level, you can take that same cell phone and you can put it into a set of goggles and you can put that set of goggles on and then you get some of the experience. But to really go for it, to really take it to the nines, you have to get, um, you need to get a system like, we don't need to get one, but I'm just gonna show you. You get this system and you put this on and now I am in a world, but here's the key. It's stabilized, okay? I am looking at my wall here and now I'm looking at me and now I'm looking over here at the screen. There is another principle that um, Maria Montessori came up with, uh, or she discovered, and, and it's, it's pretty self-evident when you get into it. It's the idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation comes from here. That's what Tocorio is, create the art of the heart. It's the ultimate intrinsic motivation to learn. And extrinsic motivation comes from outside and it never works. It's punishment. It's like learn in school because the state says you have to learn. That's a terrible reason to learn. Um, sit in this chair, don't move because you're bothering other people. Well, bothering other people is kind of valid, but what if I've got a bunch of energy and I can't, is it possible for me to learn while I'm running around the building? Because that's kind of how I want to learn when I'm nine years old and I'm a boy and I'm like, ah, and I've got just crazy amounts of energy in my body. Um, this kind of learning, when you are experiencing this inside the headset, it's intrinsic because you could just stare at the wall and never pay attention. When I'm saying something and you're not that interested, you can like, um, you can look away and do something else. The best way to uh, experience this long, long form is to get yourself a wheelie chair and put yourself in it like this. So you can basically relax and you can sit down and then when you're in here, you can look around and you can find what you wanna look at and you can, you can do this. They're also, what's so cool about this environment is you can't take a cell phone in there. So, you know, what's the big thing that teachers complain about? You know, or not all teachers, but if you, in order to have a group of people go through an experience together, there's gotta be focus. So you gotta put the cell phones away. If people are, uh, if people are like getting distracted by a cell phone a lot, then it's not gonna work out very well. It's not gonna, it's not gonna play well. Um, you're not going to have the kind of neurological focus that you need. And I, you know, there's a whole nother, there's a whole nother thing to be said about, um, you know, the focus in education, but you know, what's really easy to focus on. It's really easy to focus on something you care about, something that you're very deeply interested in. And, uh, that becomes possible when the subject comes from here. Okay. So you can go and you can come to my website and you can download the original HD file without any compression, as high a bandwidth as I can give it to you. And that, get, that comes to you. That isn't hosted on one server that can be shut down. That's hosted as a torrent. A torrent is a distributed model of, of, of doing this. And this is where, because we have accumulations of technological power in the hands of few people, we need to be looking at decentralized solutions for everything decentralized education, 
decentralized communication, decentralized information storing, decentralized technology uh, innovation. Uh, de I mean, it, it just it's a it's a metaphor in the body that is very important, and that is that if my finger, the cell in my finger, starts freaking out over here, it doesn't necessarily affect the cell over here. They share a bloodstream, like a blood system, and they share an electrical system. So there's sort of tolerances that all of these different um, units in our society have to, you, you can't, this one cell can't just like go nuts and then and do whatever the hell it wants. That's cancer, right? Or could be described as cancer. Um, what you want is you want a harmony between it, right? So when we're talking about society and like all the people, the economic systems, the social systems, the food production systems, the just all of it, when you take it all together, what we really want is we want this thing working more smoothly. We want more intrinsic motivation to be in it and for it to, for it to, for it to respond to rules and laws that are based on biology. That's what we are. We're living biology and this system out here, whatever we end up building, it better by God support this. It better support a physical being, you know, and it better be able to raise a child. I mean, families raise childs, people raise childs, but like support for mom and dad to be with a kid, uh, to raise it, to bring it uh, to fruition. This is what, this is the real important gold in our society. This is the stuff that actually helps us to take big evolutionary uh, leaps forward. So we're on a pirate ship. This pirate ship uses some platforms to get out there and to let people see, but I am saving the masters. And I, I put, every time I make a new master file, I put it into a bottle. And every time I publish one of these, I throw the bottle and I don't have control of it anymore. It's, it's broadcast into torrent land. And basically the more people that listen to this, the more people that download and maintain that network of files, the longer it'll be. The reason why my asteroid miners in 2033 understand or can hear what I'm saying is just because, uh, because it was stored in such a way, society created some kind of structure that allowed certain sorts of knowledge to be sort of archived. Archive.org is a, is a good organization that, that does this kind of stuff. Um, I created my first podcast in 2004. Um, I was, I, with my wife, we created a podcast called In the Treehouse with Tuck and Cheryl. My name used to be Tuck, Tuck Treehouse. My wife was uh, Cheryl May. And um, ah, those are our names. But um, the, they're older names. The, um, the, we made this podcast and we put it out there. And you can go listen to 25 episodes of us on archive.org. If you just search for In the Treehouse with Tuck and Cheryl, some really crappy versions of the files, very compressed versions of the files, have been put out there. So, the, um, oh, it just, you know, in this world of doxing and, and everybody getting into everybody's stuff, I mean, uh, for a really long time, I've tried to maintain some kind of privacy, some kind of personal um, independence uh, from the world by not... Uh, by not sending signals into social media, but this is a new era for me, and this is a, this is a change. Our world has gotten to a point where it's not it's not possible for me to sit back and not share some of the express some of the things that I'm doing. I uh, this this process this decorio environment that I will describe to you over probably a couple of episodes. It's designed so that when you finally get to the point where you're making a broadcast into the world, you have something to say that's useful. I think it's so fun to watch young people on social media just goofing around with it, just doing all kinds of stuff. It makes me sad that that stuff will be there for forever, that there will be that they will be somehow held to those kinds of things. I think that one of the ways that this will all get washed out is with a lot of people putting information on social media. That's why if you if you like social media, if you like Twitter, you need to understand that if you just yell on Twitter all day long, you're tearing down that system. You're making Twitter a nightmarish hellscape and nightmarish hellscapes don't endure. Okay? They go away. They get they get they get changed, they get done. So, yes, have an impact in the world. Yes, participate in the reality. Yes, broadcast your best things, but go through some kind of refining process before you um, make what you broadcast the result of diligent and real work that you're doing. 
And then the things that you broadcast, kind of the protocol that you're following as an individual is gonna be helpful. It'd be so cool if there were protocols of Tecorio environments, like I've got mine, maybe you've got yours, and there's a way that we could cooperate on a project or make new stuff or build new things. It's just very exciting. It, it gets us excited as people to, to collaborate with other people. I got one more concept I wanna put in here, and I think we can, uh, oh, we've got a bunch of stuff. Um, we got to get back to those. Uh, we got to get back to those early Christians, um, but let's do it this way. Joe Rogan takes DMT. He sees something related to God. He sees God. He sees he sees a dimension, uh, an experience. I can't speak for him, but um, he sees something that is very powerful and very impactful. It's so impactful he brings it up all the time. It's so impactful he really tries to figure out what it means because it's so critical. It's so important. It's so fundamental. All right. He talks about this on his podcast. He is exploring these ideas with other people. Young people watch this. I teach a class on basic science. Like my technology kids, how I get out of the magic thing is we go back to basics. We go back to the atom, we go back to the electron, we go back to fundamental physics, and we start there. We start with the Big Bang, we go from the Big Bang all the way through to cell phones. And in a world that is increasingly being sculpted by our technology, I understand a little bit about how technology works. I'm, I mean, at different levels, at different levels of understanding, at different, at different levels of, of focus. And it's still overwhelming to me. And I'm pretty much an expert in this kind of stuff. Like the, because of my life of experience, the, and my application of it, my employment around it, all this other stuff. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like to be a person today and not understand how basic physics works and how, to, to hold the cell phone and be like, that's magic and that's all you've got, that's not good enough. We've got it. We've got to understand more fundamentally what's going on. I teach people how, I taught people for 10 years how the internet works, how technology works, how cell phones work from the ground up. And one time I heard Joe Rogan say, he goes, I'll never be smart enough to understand how the internet works. I'm too dumb. That's fixed. That's the idea that you're either given the knowledge of how the internet works or you don't. The growth mindset says, might say, might rephrase that and say, I don't understand how the internet works right now, but I, I have the understanding, I have the ability to learn basic ideas. And if you string enough basic ideas together over a long enough period of time, in the right hands perhaps, as a teacher, you can then put those concepts together and you can basically understand what's going on at those fundamental levels. So I always wanted to create a class for the Joe Rogans of the world, for the people who felt like they just couldn't understand. That's fixed. Um, that's not true. You can't understand anything. You just need enough experience and enough exposure to it and enough attempts and enough tries and enough encouragement in the right environment. You get all the things together, you can be walking and talking like the best of them. So when I would talk about the fundamentals of things, um, we, would, we would start with this very, very simple idea. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, let's start with this one. So, electricity. Electricity. This is uh, this one simple idea. How does electricity work? We would start there. And um, let me, I'm going to give you, should I give you the fast version or should I give you the, sh the long version? I don't know if my tech is going to survive. So far, I've been lucky. I've had it going for about an hour. I'll tell you. Um, je suis désolé, je suis en retard. That means I am sorry, but I am slow. <laughs> I know I seem kind of fast. It's taken me two years to get to the point where this broadcast actually works. I have been working as hard as my soul would let me, like struggling, making many, many hundreds and dozens of attempts to get this thing launched and get this thing going so that we can have this conversation. I'm really glad that I figured it out, but it took a really long time to get here. I'll tell you the short version. Uh, as, we're, as, I'm, as I'm working on electricity, uh, we start with electricity and then we build that up. And then we go, we get into the atom and we get into the electron and what the electron is because the electricity is basically the movement of the electron. When I talk about that, I get to a point where I talk about fundamental shape, okay? I'm going to skip a little bit here. Oh, I shouldn't skip, should I? I shouldn't skip. All right, I won't skip. Let's go through it. 
And let's just assume that the technology is going to work and that someone is somehow insanely interested and is hanging around with me. You know what? Screw the rest of that stuff. Screw going fast. Let's go slow, my friend. Electricity, how does it work? Think about it. We've got, I've got the only, the, the exciting part about our communication is that it's completely mediated by electricity. Different pulses of electricity are being encoded into patterns. Those are being stored on hard drives. Those are being broadcast through the internet, stored on your hard drive briefly, then played back. If you get on the, if you go to my website and you download the torrent, you can download the entire undifferentiated uh, electromagnetic experience, which means that this little camera I see, you're kind of in there for me. You're in this room with me. In a way, you're peeking back at me through time, through the electromagnetic spectrum, and you're here, and we're together, and we're learning some things. There was a, when I would, I'll give you, the, I'll give you this other piece though. I would explain shape. I would explain basic shape. The, there's five basic shapes that are called platonic solids. And they're mathematically provable as the simplest shapes in the universe. This is the simplest of them. This is a tetrahedron. Just imagine the green parts of this, okay? Um, a tetrahedron, when you, you have a point, imagine a point being like this little white thing, right? You take two points, and, or you take a pencil, you put the point down, that's your first point, then you drag it. Now you have two. So now you have a line. That is a... That is a um, one-dimensional experience, right? It's got length, but it doesn't have any width. You then, you can then make a simple shape like a triangle, and now you have, you have three points here, and now you have a two-dimensional object. It's got height and it's got width. Now, when you go to the next dimension, when you come into three dimensions, you then come into, you have to add a fourth point, okay? Point, point, line, two-dimensional shape, triangle. Now you get another point, and now you're in space. There is a boundary in our universe between abstract math and our physical world. And this same boundary, I think, was described by Einstein when he said E equals M C squared. The E is energy. The M, that's electricity. The M is matter. That's the, the hard stuff, the, the solid stuff. Okay, You can't have one without the other. They, they live together. Well, you can. I guess you can have simple protons. No, one proton, you're going to have to have an electron. So anyway, these things are very closely intertwined in our daily experience. Okay? So you, you got the E, energy, equals matter, and then you've got C, which is the speed of light. So the speed of light turns out to be this incredibly important thing, and it's the rate at which electromagnetism travels. So light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it travels from that light bulb to my eye, from my face, when it bounces off my face, to that camera, you know, speed of light, very, very, very fast, okay, but not infinite, <laughs> not, not as, not, an, there's not an infinity sign there, there's an actual number associated with that. So energy, what that equals sign in E equals MC squared means, forget the C squared for a second, right? What, it, what the C squared means is you take a really large number and multiply it by itself, square it, take C times C, square it, and that you get a really big number times a really big number. So what that means is that um, energy equals matter times a really big number times a really big number, which means that every little piece of matter has an almost inconceivable amount of energy in it. And nuclear energy, when we split the atom and we blow things up, that is a demonstration of the energy that's in a small amount of matter. A nuclear core in one of those bombs, a plutonium or a uranium bomb, it's like a thing this big. And you crush it with an explosion, a geometric arrangement of explosives which <clears throat> detonates it to a core. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get two of those atoms, those plutonium or uranium atoms, to knock each other and they, one of them breaks. And when one of them breaks, they, the little pieces go out and they break the other ones and you get what's called um, a, a fission experience. Fission is when matter breaks apart. And when it breaks apart very quickly, you get a nuclear explosion. Okay, E equals MC squared. You have the tetrahedron is, uh, is a, the four-sided one. It's the simplest thing. It's also really good for engineering. If you want to hold something up, that's a good way to do it. But it's an okay way. The better way to hold it up is what the Egyptians understood. This little guy. That is the basis for making roofs, making houses. Bunch of walls and a house, okay? The next most complicated one, it's called a hexahedron. Hexa is Latin for six. 
one, two, three, four, five, six sides, just the blue ones here on this one. The next one up is called an octahedron. Octa means eight. There are eight faces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The green ones here, that's an octahedron. If you take just the top of this and you put sand everywhere, that is um, an the top part of an octahedron is what the uh, pyramids in Egypt are. That's, that's what that shape is. And imagine, that is shape talk over time. Those Egyptians are speaking to us and they're like, check out this shape. <laughs> that, was, that was a language, that was one little piece of their culture that we can now hear, that we don't understand the context for it, but it's pretty amazing, I think, that, that, that conversation about what that is. There is a, um, the icosahedron, which is, uh, icosa means 20-sided, which is all the blue sides here. And then there's a dodeca, uh, that means 12-sided. So these are, these are the five fundamental shapes. And they have all kinds of cool properties and relationships with each other. The, eventually, what ends up happening is um, with that equation sign, E equals M, energy equals matter, times a lot, uh, there, is a there is a crossover point that you have to go through in here. That crossover point is, um, is the boundary between matter and energy. Energy, I believe, is the abstract abstraction of the universe, and it's always... Um, it's like, it's a, it's a different thing than matter. Because energy, the way that energy works as is related to electricity. So electric, so anyway, long, let me just give you this one little piece. Every time I would bring out these fundamental shapes. Oh, hold on. Every time I would bring out these fundamental shapes. Um, uh, I would get... I would get students who would pull me aside afterwards and they would say something to the effect, they'd be like, hey, have you ever taken DMT? And I'd be like, wait, what? What do you mean? Have I ever taken DMT? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're talking about that geometry, um, are you talking about the flower of life? The flower of life is a, a particular type of geometry, a particular type of geometric pattern that this is a, this is a very beautiful artistic kind of rendering of this thing. Turn that off here. Hold on a second. One moment, see the play. Cool. And uh, this is this particular this particular pattern, this particular uh, thing. This is very beautiful. Okay. This has got a lot of light in it. It's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of like gradation in it. But if you can imagine just the primary just the primary shape around here with nothing else in it, um, that's that's the flower of life, okay? And they would say, have you ever seen the flower of life? Have you ever, have you ever, uh, do you know anything about the flower of life? Because basically, when I would start, when I would start talking about, about fundamental shape, I would, um, fundamental shape would trigger something in them that they would talk about, they'd want to talk about this. And when they, when they wanted to talk about the flower of life, what they wanted to talk about was their DMT experience. So what I think, what I, what I saw happening out there in the world was I've seen an entire generation of young people be inspired by Joe Rogan. They know there's some kind of potential. They know that there's some kind of cool thing that's happening inside of them. And they, they listen to Joe Rogan. And, you know, Joe Rogan's like, hey, man, what you need to do is you need to go do, you know, smoke DMT. That's Joe Rogan's advice. On, he, he gives it a lot of caveats. You don't just go smoke DMT. I've never smoked DMT. I'm, I'm, if you hang out with me a little bit, I'll tell you some ways that you can probably get around it. But, um, he, you know, he, they would, DMT is a dimethyltryptamine. It's a hormone. It's a hormone that's produced in the pineal and the pituitary glands in the, in the brain. And those, those organs that are up here produce it. It's the same kind of chemical that gets produced when you dream. So what's DMT like? Well, what was last night like for you? What, was your, what were your dreams like last night? People are like, oh, I don't dream. It's like, you definitely dream. It, most people have between like five and eight dreams a night. But we, we train ourselves to forget them. We train ourselves to forget these abstract things that we, quote, don't have any use for. You know a really good way to remember your dreams? is to just talk about them. Just talk about your dreams with one person, a partner, who, someone in your life you care about. Start talking about your dreams. And when you describe your dreams, your, your subconscious mind 
meaning all of the part of your nervous system that's not your conscious mind isn't in control of, your subconscious mind will start highlighting that. And if you just have to, imagine you made it a, a thing where every time you go to work, you, when you, the first thing you do when you get to work, you get there, you get your cup of coffee, and you're gonna tell everybody about your dreams. You're gonna start remembering your dreams if you start valuing them. So anyway, DMT is nothing to worry about. It's a quickly absorbed um, chemistry in the body. It's very non-toxic. It's not as toxic as alcohol, let's say. The side effects from alcohol are gonna be a lot more intense. However, the side effects of alcohol are not gonna include divine revelation, which DMT might do. <laughs> So might might be consistent in this way. In any event, um, you, the way that you the, the DMT the what you do, what the way it works is it's in everything. So it's in plants, it's in your salad, it's in lettuce, it's in everything. So all you have to do is get a plant that has a lot of it in it. You have to go through some very basic chemistry chemical steps to extract it, and then you can essentially refine it, and then you can smoke it. And when you smoke it, boom you give yourself a big boost of DMT like all of a sudden, all right? DMT, um, Rick Straussman, um, The Spirit Molecule, great documentary. Um, he's got so many cool books about DMT. And Rick Straussman is the guy who, um, it runs MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, which is gonna make MDMA or ecstasy, if you went to raves in the 90s or recently. Of course, recently, eh, drugs are so crazy right now. You know, there's, you can, if you go to a rave, and you take a drug now, you are rolling the dice if you do not test that stuff. There is there is so many chemicals coming out of China and just Mexico through China. And, you know, there's just so much craziness out there right now that I would be, man, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not doing psychedelics in my life, like just on the street now. Like that would be really, really, really nuts. Um, you should definitely like if there's any young people that are listening to this, like take your time, do your research, um, set and setting, like really figure out how you want to have that experience and what a good environment is to have that experience in before you just like jump into that kind of stuff. Because um, it's profound and you're going to be releasing, if you do a psychedelic, you're going to be releasing an enormous amount of energy from your subconscious. And that subconscious energy is going to... Um, um, need somewhere to go and if you haven't thought it through and you and you let's say you go to a festival and you just take a psychedelic at a festival and then you're like out of control with your environment boy that energy is going to come up and it's going to go somewhere and you might not like where it goes and you might not like you as that energy flows through you and your behavior and your actions here's how you do it calm still quiet safe um put some boundaries between you and other people. Make it so that when that when that energy is released from your subconscious mind, it has a nice environment to go into. That is thinking about set and setting. We'll talk more about that. But um, for the moment, uh, okay, so anyway, you just take, you, you can get DMT out of nature, right? And you have this experience. Uh, Rick Straussman, the spirit molecule, they did a lot of study. It's, a end, it's the end of life chemical. One of the reasons why I don't want to smoke DMT is because I want my cherry DMT experience to be on my deathbed. I want, I want like the big colossal to happen at the moment of my death. Hopefully that'll be cool, but it depends on how you die. It depends on the circumstances around your death, like how quick you get, you know, that happens. But when people see their life flash before them, that might be a DMT burst, right? There's this really beautiful image that um, Alex Gray, uh, my favorite artist, best artist in the world, as far as I'm concerned, um, is, he has this image of someone on their deathbed and it's on the cover of DMT, the spirit molecule. And it shows this kind of um, pathway of energy leaving the body, going into kind of this one sort of mandala. Um, that's something we can pull up. We can pull that up. I'm sure that'd be just fine. Let's see here. Here we go. Let's pull this down. Let's go. Alex Gray. Okay. So here is uh, here is the cover of that book, and uh, you can see it over here on the right. Now this is Alex Gray and. Um, 
you know, what's so cool is that this piece of art that he's created here, there's a, there's a point source in the middle, this enormous uh, field of light, you know, and oh, there's Joe Rogan, uh, 2010. Uh, he's there in like some government bunker talking about this chemical. It reminds me of the beginning of uh, Pineapple Express, of a hilarious movie. And they're like, uh, I think they have like chemical number 2784. I can't remember the name of it, but it's like they're, they're smoking weed in this government bunker and they lose their minds. That, that reminds me of that. That's hilarious. Okay, DMT, the spirit molecule. What's so cool about Alex Gray is when he describes this consciousness, it's almost as if perception itself is a part of it. So this experience of this surface with all these eyes on it. Um, when, I, uh, when I went through my own initiation of uh, self-realization, when I was in a, um, this mystical spiritual order, um, it, um, I, when I first approached the self, I was, it was like I was, it was like I had, it was like I had drifted through this space and I was this body and I landed on this surface of this giant sphere and this sphere was covered with eyes and the eyes were perception themselves. And I've seen that, I've seen Alex Gray describe that in his art a lot. So DMT, end of life, when one dies, this would be an image of the spirit leaving the body, headed back to the one undifferentiated source at the heart of all things. That, um, that is kind of the, the thing. Now imagine what it's like to be right here at this point, right here at the point between body and energy, okay? The, um, there's an old word that I studied for a, lot of, a long time, Merkaba, okay? Merkaba, uh, mer was uh, this Egyptian word, apparently, for a kind of light. And then ka and ba were like uh, spirit and body. So the science of the Merkaba, as it is, um, no experiments, or some, but very little theory and science, two counter-rotating fields. So imagine a magnetic field and an electric field, you know, and they're, they're rotating. And when you get the frequency between them, right, based on the Fibonacci sequence, there is a harmonic experience, okay? That is the vehicle of the soul, the Merkaba. I know I'm skipping a bunch of steps here, forgive me. And um, that, that, that the light that is made from the interaction of the Merkaba, that's the mer. So <coughs> ka and ba, the, the interaction of body and spirit, of matter and energy. I think what happens is that when my students um, distill their plants and they refine their DMT and they smoke their DMT and they, and they basically go and they erupt out of the body or into the body, however you want to say it, they, they don't have any awareness of their body. When they're in this state, they don't report being in their body anymore. And a lot of times, many of them report traveling into the flower of life, okay? Now, the flower of life is, um, might one, my theory here is that it might, what it might just be is energy, just abstraction. What's it like to know your consciousness as mediated by the body? And then to know your consciousness as only being mediated by pure energy. It makes sense to me that one might see something like this. Or one might, one might see this exact symbol as one travels, choom, mandala, right? Into, into the infinite. Like you are going from matter to energy. And you go there in a very short period of time. And you come back from a DMT trip in a short period of time. Because your body metabolizes the DMT. In the same way that you wake up and you think about a dream. And you're like, huh, I'll remember this wait, did I have a dream? And you forget it. That is the moment your body metabolized the dimethyltryptamine and all the other hormones connected to it. It's probably not just one chemical. It's probably a whole bunch of different chemicals, like all mixed, all, all, all working together. So here's how, here, here's why the flower of life is actually a very simple symbol. You take a calipers, um, basically a, a, you just have to have a, you ever seen those Mason temples and they have the picture of the, the calipers and Basically, it's a point that you can stick in paper and then there's a pencil that you can put in there. Uh, a compass in geometry, right? A compass is how you make a circle. So imagine you drop a point and then you swing a circle, okay? Now go to any point on the circle and then let's say, let's say you go to this point and then you drop your circle and then you swing another circle there. When you do it, there's going to be two points that intersect with the first one. Drop your compass there and swing another, swing another circle. Drop your compass there and swing another circle. And there's two more points on the original circle 
swing circles there, swing circles there, those circles line up there. So here's the kind of magic of sacred geometry a little bit. That size of circle has one, two, three, four, five, six points. All right, 360 degrees in a circle divided by six, you get a certain number of angles, a certain uh, percentage of angles between, what is that, like uh, 60 degrees, like between these things. So 60, uh, 120, 180, blah, 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 to 360. I'm dyslexic, so math is a little hard on the fly for me. But uh, in any event, you can take one circle and you can drop the points. And if you keep doing that, you basically get the flower of life. Now, one of the tenets of sacred geometry and is, is this idea that the form itself um, is a kind of meditation. So if you imagine an icosahedron, a 20-sided object in your imagination, and you just, you can, you can kind of have, this is a physical model, this is called a zoom tool. Um, uh, zoom tools are basically kits you can get where you can assemble um, sacred geometry, or sh simple shapes, platonic solids, or they're, ba they're the, the five platonic solids are like the building blocks of matter. This is a long description, but when energy becomes matter, it has to come in through a doorway. And the doorway is shape. When you are a physical shape, you have to take on dimension. And when you take on dimension, you have to take on dimension based on um, some rules. You don't get to just choose. If you're going to choose a simple shape to come in through our world, you got to choose one of these five. It's got to be one of those. And... Or, I mean, if you're like going for like a simple, 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 simple shape, there's obviously you could squish or squeeze one of these or plasticize it. And you could get some other variations of it. But in, in terms of an abstract, that's the that's where you're going with it. So the you got this 20 sided object and you can play around with it in the physical. And then when you start to imagine it, when you start to actually put it into your imagination, it becomes a meditation. So early geometers, people who dealt with shape, going all the way back to Aristotle, Plato, the original, the original conceivers of our, the, the, what, our, what our Western culture is based on. That's what they were doing. That's how they were, that's how they were getting to it. They were, they were imagining shapes, abstract shapes in their imagination. And it's almost as if the mind itself is able to hold, hold shape in a very special way. Those early geometers, those early thinkers around this stuff, they described it as a meditation. They described just thinking of like a perfect sphere. Imagine a perfect sphere with one of those tetrahedrons inside of it, you know, and now it's all rotating around. You can imagine that and you can hold that in your mind as it's kind of like a, it's like a function that the mind enjoys. And it's probably related to basic, the basic truth of the, you know, informational space, the information world. What I mean by that is, um, think about the universality of number. Zero was invented at one point. Uh, Arabs, uh, the Arabic world invented the zero. Um, maybe there was some co-discovery of that at the same time, but I have to look it up. Um, one, two, three. Just there's one thing, there's two things, there's three things. You can go to any culture and those ideas, one, two, three, the primacy of number is going to be, it's like an archetype. And the way that you know, Iron Man has that suit on and is, is super powerful. This is like an archetype for us. Strong person, individual, strong individual. Um, one is an archetype. Two is an archetype. Three is an archetype. And it's really fun to, um, it's fun to play around with this kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's a bunch of books that you can, it, it, sacred geometry, and anyway, my students, let's do this here. So this is a, this is a book uh, by uh, Michael Schneider. It's called A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, A Voyage from 1 to 10. And this is a, this is a beautiful, fun, uh, kind of a, a master's class in, um, in shape. As it, and, and shape occurs in nature. It's the language that energy uses when it paints in matter. It's the language that life uses. So you can go through here and you can basically, here, is a, here are those two um, circles again. You've got the, you basically swung the one circle and then you swing the other circle. And here you go, you've got a cross section of those and you're getting a third circle inside of there and you're redividing them. It's the, it's the same process that biology goes through when you have like mitosis and you know, you've got one and then mitosis makes a copy of everything and then it splits and you've got two cells. And that's how we go from two gamete cells that form what's called a zygote, the first cell in our bodies. And then that first zygote 
doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles until we get 30 trillion cells standing here talking to you, okay? So in any event, this is a very long way of, um, of getting back to this very um, this simple idea that um, Joe Rogan, <laughs> by going through a uh, rite of passage in public, inspired an entire generation of young people to try DMT. And a lot of them, many of them, the ones that talked to me anyway, when they did, they saw something that caught their attention. And it was beautiful and it was geometric. And, you know, they try to, in that culture, then people try to figure out like, why, why are we all seeing the same things? Why is it all the same kind of thing? I think it has to do with the nature of energy, that you're basically going from a mixed reality, energy and matter here, to one of pure energy. And when you cross that threshold, it makes sense to me that you would go through uh, uh, the center point of a mandala and that that mandala would be a geometric in nature. It makes sense to me too that spirit or um, spirits, I guess would be the way that you'd talk about the entities. People talk about the entities in DMT. They talk about them talking to them and communicating with them and them having like a, those entities having like some kind of say in the, in the world. Um, you know, this is where you lose all of the, the this is where you lose the fundamental Christians a lot of times when you talk about spirits and communicating with spirits. But I want to bring it back around to those, uh, those fathers, those desert fathers. So Jesus dies 33 AD. There's a period of time until um, 367 when the Saint uh, Anthonosius Ursosis, he shows up and he writes this Easter letter. And what he says is, hey, you guys, what I want you to do is I want you to celebrate Easter on this one day. And the reason why he wrote the letter is because he was the bishop of Alexandria and Alexandria had a cool, um, a cool uh, astronomy department. They basically had a, um, they had a, uh, uh, a good observatory. And so they could basically make the calculations necessary to calculate when the venal, when the equinox happened, that center point, which is where we tag the, um, uh, that's how we tag um, Easter, the, the full moon and its relationship to that, a bunch of different things in there. But um, he basically wrote this letter and the letter said, hey, you guys, we are going to um, be celebrating Easter on this day. Uh, and this, you know, this is the day you want to celebrate it on. And let's do a little library cleanup. Let's take these um, 32 books and let's keep those. And um, it turns out that his selection of those 32 books turns out to be um, the New Testament. Turns out to be like letters from Paul. Um, it turns out to be like uh, the four uh, canonical gospels. It turns out to be like that. It was basically the formalization of a lot of, of what we think of as like the New Testament. It can't happened in 367. Now imagine how many years that is after Jesus actually walked the earth, okay? Up until that point, there were these, these holy people, these desert saints, and they, they, live, they wanted to live close to God and they wanted to live in that reality that Jesus was talking about, in communion with God. And so they would go out in the desert and they would found these, um, these beautiful monasteries and these, well, beautiful, beautiful in the sense that God lived there with them, right? Beautiful in the sense that they cloistered themselves and pulled away from the world. And they said, you know, all of your Twitter, all your nonsense, why don't you just keep all that? the version of Twitter in their day. They're like, you can just keep all that. I'm going to come out here and I'm going to pray and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to commune with God and I am going to get deep into this because that is where the answers come from. And um, they founded these desert uh, monasteries and they had this, the desert tradition. The desert tradition had a lot of books, okay? There was lots of different texts that were out there. And um, this guy, uh, St. A here, he uh, basically said, look, get rid of some of these other texts, keep these other ones. And if we hadn't made some archaeological discoveries, we would have really never known what those other ones were because the good monks and nuns of their day burnt that other stuff and said, yeah, that stuff's all trash. And this is going to be what we, what we focus on. But think about that. That is one dude, maybe with some smart dudes and dude, dudettes and smart gals around him, um, giving him input on what's going to be the canon right? But this is a creative process, my friends. There were texts and there were all kinds of cool stuff. Some of the stuff they got rid of was more about the feminine side of God, Sophia. The um, Sophia being the, the feminine aspect of God or wisdom. Sophia is a Greek uh, word, I believe. And, um, you know, that, that 
feminine understanding, that understanding that the feminine can hold God or hold the divine in a different but complementary way to the way that masculine energy, that's something that we've had to rediscover. And Carl Jung in the 50s said, you know, the, the Trinity, that is the, the Catholic understanding, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, that Trinity is, is, it, it is being squared. And so geometrical, sacred geometrical transformations, like the squaring of the circle, is an old geometer's way. It's how, how do you go from that circle to a perfect square? And there's different ways that you can get through it. But those, those sort of solving those problems is analogous to us solving the problems inside of our own psyche. How do we solve the problem of male and female being more like polarities, like positive and negative in an electrical charge. Like you can't like you can't really have one without the other, right? You've got to have both. When you when you decide to go from being uh, a being, uh, an organism that is, has asexual reproduction, meaning it can just copy itself infinitely, like a cell can, to sexual reproduction, where you have to get a protocol involved and you have to get another being involved, and then you're gonna you're gonna take two and the two are gonna become one. And that one is going to carry with it half of the material for um, for the reproduction of the, the the organism, the species. How does how do you fit this all together? Like, how do you fit this all together in your psyche? Carl Jung talked about the square being father, mother, son, and daughter, and and so it was like, it was like it was like God, the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus and Mary, basically co redeemers. I think the Catholic Church did some blessing on the concept of Mary as a co-redeemer. The idea that you can, in the Catholic faith, you can get to God through Jesus. You can also get to God through Mary and that these are equal and valid routes. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing stuff. So uh, back to our practice, right? Back to our practice of the presence of God. So this, this thing that these desert mothers and fathers are doing out here in the middle of the desert, they're reading all their, all their books. Um, later, we uh, discover um, 13 bound books. These books are called codices. It was called the Nag Hammani Library. And the Nag Hammani Library had little pieces of some of the traditional stuff in it, some, some tie-ins. Um, to the, the canonical kind of books. But basically, if you went to a, a monastery library and in like 250 AD and you could read, which was good luck, like you could, um, you could basically pull books off the shelf that were like, oh, here's like the book of Luke, you know, like Luke's story. Here's the, here's the gospel of Matthew. And you could read something that was similar to what we have now from that. And then you could also pull off this other book, uh, um, Sophia or the gospel of Mary. Um, you know, these different, these different feminine kind of approaches to God, and these would all be in the same library, okay? And what they did is they said, take this part of the library, pull it off the shelf, make that eternal, burn the rest of it, and they burnt their books, okay? And they, they destroyed it. Well, the Nag Hammani Library was a collection of some of these things that got burned. It was a collection of some of these things that got thrown out. So it's just a simple way of saying you have one text that can become uh, informed, you can have one set of texts, which is our Bible, but that was a distillation from a larger set. And right there, right there, in that one moment, you're talking about the, um, the decisions that were made to focus on this body of knowledge other, rather than this other body of knowledge. That's a choice. That's a choice that a human made, okay? That's a choice that a human made uh, to, to limit the library. Now, if you ever read the Nakamani Library, you can see why the, the, these choices were made. You can, you can see old Egyptian religious texts. Like, um, there's like, I mean, basically, they thought that it was spells and magic. They were, they were chanting vibration, and these vibrations would have effect in the world. You know, someday, when we figure out how to, you know, manufacture matter, like, like if we ever figure out how to, like, producer like a replicator like in star trek it'll be something like sound vibration a pattern of vibration is then organizing the matter into earl gray hot and john luke picard drinks his drink right so you know the, the egyptians might have been onto something with their vibrations and such when we say amen in the west um they are uh, amen and om a-u-m those were words for the eternal vibration. You know, OM might be the core vibration at the heart of everything. 
That's what Paramahansa Yogananda would say, the, the, the one vibration at the heart of everything. And so our word, Amen, comes from this old Egyptian word, Om. Our, um, you know, the temples that the Egyptians made were like these palaces of sacred geometry. They were, um, I've heard so many dozens of different interpretations of Egyptian culture and what it was and how it works and all this. And one of my favorite ones, this is just me choosing from a large variety of theories, is, is this idea that geometry, if our bodies are, are geometric, if our, the Hindus would tell you this, that our, the geometry of these simple platonic solids occur around our um, energy tube. The, the Hindus call it the antakarana. I've heard it called the prana tube. Um, it, has, it has a lot of different, the, the hollow bone um, in some from primitive cultures describe it as this. This, this tube that, that information as energy can flow through, okay? You've got this tube and as energy flows through it, there is a geometric expression of that energy out from that core thing. That's one of the kind of core ideas in terms, in, in my experience, of taking an abstraction like a circle. How would you take a circle, which is 2D, turn it into a sphere, which is 3D, and then how might you practice sphere nature in your energy body, meaning the part of you that is made out of energy. And I think embodying geometry is kind of what that, all that sacred geometry and the Merkaba stuff and all that, it's, that's what it's all about. What if the Egyptians had this understanding and, they, and then they put that understanding into their buildings so that you might have, let's say, the temple of love. Let's say the temple of love somehow creates a geometric, physical, architectural resonance for the experience of love. When you go to the temple of love as an initiate, you, you, you get taught by your teachers there about the nature of love and you, you learn about love and then you, and the building itself harmonizes, resonates with the frequency of love, right? And you could, you could scientifically produce this, right? You could, you could have someone experience love and you could put a um, electromagnetic magnetometer on their body and you could watch the frequency of love come out of them. And then you could, um, you could somehow take that, that wave and you could turn it into a circle and you could, you know, create it as a proportion and then you could build a physical structure that was based on that proportion. That's like a experiment you could actually run, right? You could have the, the heart signature of one individual produce a physical geometry. And then on some level, there would be a resonance, especially if you told the person there was a resonance, right? Like, cause you know, the placebo effect works like 40% of the time or 30%, whatever it is, it's, it's more than zero. So our belief and our understanding about, if you make a room and you say, this room is the room you experience pure love in, some people are gonna go in that room without, any, without anything else special being done, just that knowledge, and be like, this is the pure love room, I can feel the pure love, right? It's just, a, it's a, uh, it'll, it'll happen. So maybe the Egyptians encoded in their actual temples the, um, the structure of shape um, that was the teaching that they were trying to imbue. And maybe they had multiple temples that you know a person might learn safety and security or being a warrior or, or physical you know like what we would call self-defense and then maybe you go to another one you learn love and you learn about how to stay in harmony with the natural forces of the universe the environment you know something we could learn a little bit about now right and uh and also other people and then maybe you go to another one and it's about wisdom and it's about using the mind you know imagine the the chakra system in the body and you could like focus on one of these maybe you go to one and it's about communication and it looks like um, the Greeks when they created theater, you know, um, so these temples in Egypt are the prototype of the churches that we went back and made in Europe. We base our churches on the buildings we saw in Egypt and the Egyptians had these mystery schools and the mystery schools were basically where this wisdom kind of stuff was taught. That is the pattern that we've used in the West for our institutions. It's the reason why, um, you know, you we build big buildings and we say, you know, like a bank, and we say, yeah, all the value and all the money is, is included in there, but now all the money and the value, it's just bits on a spreadsheet somewhere. There's no physical stuff to back it up anymore. Kind of like a way of the shape is a way of concretizing an abstraction, would be one way to think about it. Um, you can play around with geometry and you can start to kind of experiment with it and that's a good kind of primer 
uh, to get used to get used to kind of working with uh, the geometry inside your body. Um, the uh, the Greeks, you know, they had this um, this ritual that they went to um, called the uh, the Eleusian Mysteries. Um, the, the Champs Elysees, uh, the, the main road, and the Arc de Triomphe that Napoleon walked through in, cent, in the, one of the central, central centers of Paris. The, uh, the, the Champs Elysees, Champs is mushrooms, Elysees is Elysium, the um, Elysian, the Elysian mysteries, or the Elysian mushrooms. So the Champs Elysees are the mushrooms of this one place, and Eleusius was this place where the Greeks would go and they would have this big party for like two weeks. And this big party would have a lot of initiation in it, a lot of social initiation. Towards the end of it, um, they would go into this underground cavern and they would all drink this drink called the Kikion. And the Kikion was a, a rye ergot beverage. So it was ergot, and ergot is the same chemistry that Albert Hoffman started with, and he took a little, distilled a little bit of it, uh, some of the part of ergot. He was trying to come up with a way to handle birth pains, I think. And um, Ergot had had some history of helping, like causing some kind of neurological stunning or something like that, or maybe it was a pain relief, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, Albert Hoffman in the 1940s distilled LSD, got a little bit on himself, ate it accidentally, and uh, had the bicycle day, had his first, had the first trip, the first LSD trip in Western culture in modern times. But in, in the Lucius, in Elysium, I'm getting the names wrong. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confusing two two terms there. But this this ritual, the the kikion was a rye ergot derived beverage. We don't know exactly what it was, but when they what, what they would do is they would make a big mug of it, and everybody would drink a little bit of it, and um, then they would go down into this underground place, and they would trip. And they said that people weren't really people until they had gone through this initiation. This is where the Platonic solids came from. The um, Plato, Aristotle, all these people in that part of the world at that time, they would go to Egypt and they would learn these mysteries and what was existing of the mystery schools and they would bring this knowledge back. We call this the Platonic solids because Aristotle was the first one to write it down. Plato never wrote anything down. Aristotle was Plato's student. And these, these basic shapes, these basic abstract shapes might have been derived under the influence of something like LSD at the, at the foundation of Western history. We can't, these, the, the interplay of chemistry and consciousness has given us the techne, the, the technology that now exists as personal computers, as cell phones, as all this kind of stuff. If you take the same kind of um, thinking and you bring it forward, there's a really cool book. Uh, there's a series of really cool books. They've all been written very recently. Um, what the Dormouse Saw uh, or Said. What the Dormouse Said. It's, a, it's the history of psychedelics and the personal computer. So the personal computer was a big room full of equipment. And there was a certain group of people that were trying to figure out how to get the room of equipment into something that you could have. And, they, and the, the analogy that Steve Jobs was famous for describing was the bicycle analogy. That when you, you look at, and this was, a, this was a concept that was in the, the mind, the zeitgeist of all these computer scientists in the 1960s and 70s. And um, the, the analogy is, is that the condor is a very efficient form of bird. It uses the very, well, you look at all of nature, you look at all the animals, and what is the most efficient form of activity? And it was the condor, something like that. And anyway, but if you add technology, the techne, the humans and the bicycle was the most efficient form because the human on a bicycle was very super, super duper efficient, okay? The, um, the, the place where a lot of this work was happening was called the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, SAIL. And they were doing the work of taking the, the room size computer and putting it into something, a user interface, a mouse, the screen, the, graphics, the, the graphic display, printers, all of that came out of this one lab. That lab was located down the street from a legal LSD research facility. For $500, you could go and you could, per, you could go through a, a study and experience, and a lot of times these scientists, some of the LSD experiences and experiments, they would have to bring a problem. They would, they would, the, LSD was a research chemical, and they would go in and they would take LSD, and they would take their complex engineering and te techne, their technical problems, and then they would use LSD to solve that problem. 
And that is what gave us the personal computer. We are literally having this experience because people took ergot derived alkaloids from nature and they saw something that showed them how to solve their problems. They saw, they saw a connection that was there, almost as if they discovered it. Like mathematicians, when they come up with their theories, they, um, they don't so much feel like they, can't, they, they invented them as they discovered them, like they already exist. If there is an abstract energy informational world and a mathematician can discover it, maybe our technology, our techne is discoverable. Maybe that's what we've done. That's how we've tied the world together is by a lot of the insights that, have, that, that make super, that make silicon engineering and manufacturing possible come from these, these insights at the atomic level. Um, many of these fundamental insights are, um, are inspired by psychedelic experiences. Steve Jobs famously said that LSD was the reason why he made the iPhone. You know, so, you know, <laughs> the, that one guy, the iPhone, the iPod, you know, music in your pocket, the ability to dance wherever, all of this stuff, it all comes from, um, you know, and then computer animation. Uh, Steve Jobs created Pixar. And that was, that was, that computer animation was the tablet. He saw, you know, he saw Star Trek and he was like, why don't we have tablets? So he created the, the tablet uh, form factor, the iPhone, um, all of these, all of these, this tech, there's like five big ones that he, he came up with, original creations. He credited his insights under LSD with those discoveries. His LSD time and his time in India when he went and he studied um, Eastern kinds of thinking. So there is a rich a rich landscape here that we can explore. And um, I wanna make more, I just wanna talk about this more with you. I wanna explore it more. I wanna, I wanna teach that basic science class. I wanna go through that, that uh, electricity um, set with you and, um, and explain it. Um, it's the second day of Lent. Um, it's really fun. Uh, it's been extremely fun to, um, it's been extremely fun to make this video and to put it out there into the world. Um, one of the people that, uh, one of the first commenters that I got back on my video, this is his music. It is royalty free music. And uh, um, you can see the comments and you can see, you know, you can follow, I think his name is Mr. Trax on YouTube. And uh, this, they're very beautiful, it's very beautiful that we can all um, create and make and invent a world and invent a future uh, kind of together and to communicate in even more and deeper ways. And the, the contribution that I wanna to make to that is you. I wanna figure out a way to explain um, how a classroom, how a classroom is a stage, okay? The Greeks, one of the most amazing things that the Greeks did is they created drama. Drama is bringing together all of the, all, all of the technes, bringing them all into the same place. The, uh, Theater, theater is taking the physical space, the physical environment, and it's taking the costumes and the makeup and the lights, uh, which used to be torches and now they're electrical lights. And it's taking the sound and it's taking the, the, the stagecraft and it's taking the actors and the expression and their vocal cords and their, you know, it's, it brings all the art or theater brings all of the arts together. It, it ties all the techne together. The, the cell phone is just the tying together of a techne, and now we're on a new stage, and that's why you're in VR with me. Hopefully, you got a. Hopefully, you've got some kind of headset, and you're chilling out, and you've got a bowl going, and you're uh, you're 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 chilling out with me, and you're going through this kind of experience. And hopefully, you've got a uh, a, a lab manual. So I call this. This is the key to the Tecorio environment. I call this my lab manual. The Hebrews, their word Emmanuel means God with us. And I think, that, um, I think that we can create an environment where we are with God if we, if we are able to, to honor or respect that neurological connection that we have with the infinite inside of our own hearts within love, that we can create an environment that holds that all together. And um, so those, those, uh, those, those men and women out in the desert, um, they were called um, Carmelites. 
uh, Mount Carmel was this place where, where people kind of hung out. And the Carmelites, and particularly the Order of the Discalced Carmelites of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel, that is the order that was formed by St. Teresa of Avila, and um, it was also formed by St. John of the Cross. St. Teresa of Avila um, is an amazing saint. There's a lot written about her. St. John of the Cross, there's a lot, there's, he's, he wrote a lot. And um, like his, this, this is the work in the 1600s now, okay? Um, this is the essential St. John of the Cross. This is his, this is just a ton of uh, kind of reading and writing that he did. And um, this is one of the last, the last things uh, that he did. And um, I'll just read you this one little, this one little piece. He says, it's in that happy night of contemplation that God leads the soul by manner of contemplation so solitary and so secret, so remote and so far distant from sense that nothing pertaining to it and uh, nothing uh, that not pertaining to it nor any touch of created things succeeds in approaching the soul in such a way as to disturb it and to detain it on the road of union with love. That's a saint uh, talking about his experience of God um, in the Carmelite order. Um, and uh, the, the discalced Carmelite order means people that didn't wear shoes. So I'm discalced today, I'm wearing no shoes. And uh, St. Teresa and St. John formed this. Um, it's very interesting because St. John um, came to his experience of God because he talked about God and the brothers in the, in, the, in the Carmelite order he was in got so pissed at him that they locked him in a closet. And they locked him in a closet, I think, for several weeks. And I don't think they fed him much, and I don't think he got out of there. And um, he was locked in this little place, and it was in that little place that he experienced God. He experienced that oneness and that union and that divine connection. And when he came out, he was radiant with light. <laughs> and his, his brothers were like, oh my God, like we thought we were torturing this poor guy. And now he comes out and he just can't stop talking about God. So he definitely had some kind of endogenous dream, dream, you know, DMT kind of union, maybe, maybe it was DMT mediated, who knows, uh, experience. And um, um, many years later, in, uh, I think it was like, uh, what was it, like the 1500s? Yeah, like the 1500s, 15, like 16, maybe 1601, there was this guy, his name was Brother Lawrence, and he was in the same uh, Carmelite order. And Brother Lawrence is um, famous for uh, this experience, this thing called practicing the, the, the presence of God. So everything that Brother Lawrence wrote can be recorded in a very small volume of, of words. He didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't actually write any of it. Um, this is, oh, let's see here, what do I have? Um, this is uh, Project Gutenberg. Um, Project Gutenberg has like 60 some thousand books that are in the public domain. Um, basically, if you're more than 100 years old, and the only reason why copyright law goes 100 years is because Disney's extended it because they don't want that mouse, that, uh, what is that, Steamboat Willie? Uh, that, that picture of that, uh, that cartoon of the mouse to go into the public domain so that you know, anybody can kind of use it. But if you go to um, Project Gutenberg, uh, 61, 448 free books that are available to download, you can get the text of um, of this of this story, and there is a, there is kind of a copyright that is associated with it, so there is some stuff that you have to you have to do. But um, Brother Lawrence was in this ecstatic kind of ex union with God um, for a, an ex a very long period of his life, almost forty years, more than forty years, and um, he he talked about it and uh, this other guy wrote down what he said and um, I'm going to, I'm just going to read you uh, this little part here. The first conversation. The first time I saw brother Lawrence was on the 3rd of August, 1666, the devil's number. He told me that God had done him a special favor in converting him at the age of 18, 18 rite of passage. When our uh, nervous system and our hormonal system is pregnant with possibilities. So that's when he saw God for the first time, 18. During that winter, he saw a tree stripped of its leaves and realized that within a little time, the leaves would be renewed and that after that, the flowers and the fruit would appear. Brother Lawrence received such a high view of the providence and the power of God, which has never since left, which has never since left his soul. 
This view had perfectly set him free from the world and kindled in him such a love for God that he could not tell whether it had increased in the 40 years since uh, that he had lived. So um, this, this, this thing, you can read this in, a, in, in one sitting, uh, the practice of God's presence, the practicing the presence of God. Uh, this was what Brother Lawrence uh, said was the way to go. Um, he said it was important and it was powerful and it was good. Um, and it was, it was what he sought to do, which was basically to live close to God. And, you know, if you read this, he describes a whole bunch of stuff, but he describes like working in the kitchen and how he can be in the kitchen and he can be doing pots and pans, but that the presence of God inside of him is so strong that he's never removed from it. He's never divorced from it. It's important. I bring this up because it's important that every soul, every nervous system, every Every jewel in Indra's net, Indra's net, and in that analogy, it's a Hindu analogy, but basically what it says is Indra has this net. And every, at every point where these fibers of the net cross, there's a jewel. And in every jewel, when you're the jewel, each jewel is a reflection of everything else. So this is, a, this is Indra's net is like a holistic metaphor. This is what Brother Lawrence is talking about. Brother Lawrence is basically, if Brother Lawrence can do it in, 15, in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, you know, if he can do it, then um, everyone can do it. It might There might be some predispositions. There might be some grace involved with his particular nervous system to get it. But man, all these, all these students that I've had that have come up to me and been like, hey man, have you taken DMT? Hey, have you seen God? Like it's happening. It's happening all over the place. It's basically God is like shaking the rug. And the rug is like the electromagnetic spectrum that connects us all together. Maybe the fibers of the net of Indra is just the electromagnetic spectrum, which exists at all points in the, in the universe. You know, what is the medium that light is running to us on? It's a mystery, right? Is, it, is there something in light in these little packets of energy that come out of this light? Or is it, you know, it, it's, like a, it's like a blanket that covers all of creation and you can ripple the blanket. Um, I've got a, I've got just a couple more things I want to I want to put in here. I know it's a lot, um, but who cares? We're going slow, right? Go ahead and take pauses, play this back. Hopefully, and you know, if you're out there doing your asteroid farming, you know, you can take a little break. You can empty your bladder, catheter, or whatever you got in your spacesuit. You know, you can come inside, smoke a little space bowl, chill out with me, float in space. That's what we're doing here. There's another super treasure that should be its own thing, but I'm going to bury it so that only the wise can find it at the end of this extremely long video. So it's the second day of Lent, and I spent um, eight years in a, uh, a spiritual order. And the main text that we had was the Bible, and we also had this thing called the Poem of the Man God. Earlier, I mentioned uh, the Gospel of Mary. And um, so the Poem of the Man God, the title of this book is what the Catholic Church gave to it. Um, this was written by this woman named Maria Valtorta, but she will be the first one to tell you that it's inspired by Jesus. Um, Maria Valtorta was a woman that lived in Italy, again, with our Italian women, huh? Um, she lived there in the early 1900s. She was a teenager, and she was walking down the street, and a street thug, just a, a hooligan, had a pipe. And just for fun, the street thug cracked her in the back and it broke her spine in a way that she was in so much pain and she was bedridden for the rest of her life. She prayed to be, I believe it was Saint, like St. Saint Teresa of Avila. Was it St. Teresa, the child, the child saint? Probably, I think it was. So same, same vein of inspiration, right? And she prayed that she would be like that, like a St. Teresa, and that she could be of value to the world as an innocent. So she was innocently wounded and she laid in bed. Um, she became a nun, a Franciscan nun, uh, the Carmelites were a like an Italian form of um, of this, uh, I believe it was Italian, a uh, form of this, um, it was like this Italian Franciscan order. It was like an offshoot of them. I don't have all the connections, but anyway, the Franciscans go back to St. Francis, and St. Francis was a great saint who, um, who basically did a lot of really cool work uh, embodying God back in, you know, the 1200s, essentially. I think it's the 1200s. Okay, Google, when did St. Francis leave, live? On the website Duxters.com, they say, Francis became ill and spent the last few years of his life mostly blind. He died in 1226 while singing Psalm chapter 141. He was declared a saint of the Catholic Church only two years after his death. 
To but, find out more, look for the link in your Google Home or Google Assistant app. So he was beatified and made a saint um, in a very short period of time after his 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 death. Uh, that point I was bringing up earlier about the Catholic Church is that every year thousands of saints are submitted for consideration, and they're they're beatifying people in like the 1500s now. So they're like the the Catholic Church is like 500 years behind on its email in terms of the whole saint thing. I mean it makes sense. You can't. There's like there's so many, but like there's just experiences of people, um, you know, ha like causing things that others call miracles to happen around them, you know, for the good of the poor and the, the infirmed and the sick and healings and all this kind of stuff, miraculous healings. You know, I think science ultimately will be able to describe it, but let's not lose our train of thought here. Um, we've got St. Francis, Carmelite order. Um, we've got these, there's been so many different, okay, Maria Valtorta, sorry, my apologies. Um, Maria Valtorta, third order Franciscan nun, bedridden, Jesus appears to her physically in the room and says, you know, basically, you're going to write some stuff. You're going to be my pen. She records, um, maybe you can see it over here. This is the whole set. This is one of the books, but this is the whole set here. It's several thousand, you know, it's like more than 5,000 pages of um, things that Jesus essentially dictated to her. He, he dictated some of them. He gave her verbal instructions, but many times what he would do is he would give her an experience, a visual experience, where she would be in another, a, a, a scene from Jesus's life. And she describes these scenes in such vivid detail um, in, um, in the poem of the man God that you can basically like relive the entire experience of everything from Mary's conception all the way through Mary's assumption into heaven and the entire story, the Mary's childhood, the birth of Jesus, like every, when people have criticisms of the Bible and they're like, it's just such a small amount of stuff. The, the truth is, is that Jesus has inspired and created a lot more as a spirit. So a being that dropped the body, right? Jesus comes back after the body dies. He's got an electromagnetic being, he, he's a master, and so he can physically show up and talk to the disciples. He can physically, you know, he can be there in a body that he manifests. These kinds of things are not unknown in India. There's, there's lots of stories um, throughout India, India's spiritual history of people making and manifesting bodies after they've passed on and showing back up. Okay, so rather than this being a challenge to Christianity, this can be a validation uh, that the experience that Jesus had when he, uh, when he arrived after his death and re-inspired the disciples, basically starting his whole ministry, that whole thing fits into a, a, a global historical narrative. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it is not a one-off with Christ, okay? It is part of a, is part of a, a tradition. So the... Um, the brother Lawrence is there and he's, he's practicing the presence of God. He's, he is experiencing a personal experience of the divine. Maria Valtorta experienced a personal experience of Jesus. These early desert fathers and mothers, that's what they wanted. They wanted to have that experience of God for themselves that Jesus was talking about. They prayed for visitations from Christ, like Maria Valtorta had in the 1930s, you know, where he would show up and instruct them and lead them and, and, and kind of walk them through. Um, you know, um, let me get to this point. And then uh, there's so many things I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, one of the coolest things that happens, one of Jesus's rites of passage, one of Jesus's spiritual initiations was the transfiguration. What um, in my, the spiritual order I was in, we'd call the illumination. Now, Jesus is obviously a spiritual superstar, okay? He said it. He said, um, no, you're not the your gods. You will do these things. You will do these things and you will do greater things than these things. So, all of that, um, all of that, that empowerment that he's giving, all of these things that he's saying you will do, why will it work? It'll work because he's the same as us. I mean, yes, he is a divine, super pure being, right? Born of a virgin. Like I, there's, I, I believe that's literally possible. You know, that, you know, if you take a, if you take a zygote, if you take a, an egg and you electrocute it, it, you add electricity, it, it starts to multiply. Like uh, it, you can actually, that's how um, like bees, when they reproduce, they produce, you know, offspring that are um, genetically identical to them. Um, when, you, when, you, when you add this electricity, you don't get the variation in the offspring 
of, 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 se- of a, like a sexual partner, but you can, but it can actually, there's examples of virgin birth in nature that are biologically backed up, right? So who's Jesus born of? A virgin. Who's, who's the father? God. How does the father impregnate the mother? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit might be a description of the electromagnetic spectrum of electricity itself. The, the Holy Spirit is, is a, is a movement of energy which could be described in our modern uh, scientific terms as an electrical potential, electricity moving from one point to the other. I want to get into that, but I also want to get into this. And um, I also need to, uh, I've only got a few more minutes, and then we've got to go. Um, okay, so the transfiguration. So if, you, if you've, got, you've got all this poem of the man god, and you've got a concordance, you can basically go into the concordance and you can look up um, the, the, the correlation between the Bible and the poem of the man god. So that, here it goes. So we've got the description of the transfiguration in um, Luke 9.26, okay? Um, I got my DNA tested a couple years ago, and I'm a physical, I'm a physical blood descendant of Luke by way of my mother. Um, apparently, when you're a saint and they, you're Saint Luke, they take little pieces of your finger and your body and your bone after you die. Those are holy relics. They put those in churches. Apparently, there's saints scattered all over Europe. So you can, they can go and they can test the DNA of Saint Luke and they can see what the markers are. When I got my DNA tested with 23andMe a couple years ago, I found out that I was half Irish. Didn't know that before. That was amazing. Bit another story. But I also found out that I was a blood descendant of Luke. So this is a descendant of Luke, uh, scientifically proven, uh, telling you the story of Luke from trans- the Transfiguration. Now, I want, to, I want you to, I'm going to read you this story here in our regular, uh, the regular Bible, and then I'm going to read it to you in Maria Valtorta. And, oh, the whole point, the, the, the Catholic Church calls this a personal revelation. The, the author of this called it the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ appeared to Maria Valtorta, dictated and showed her these beautiful visions. She wrote these things down, and here's the transfiguration from Luke 9, 26. Now about eight days after saying these things, Jesus took Peter and John and James, and they went up to the mountain to pray. And while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of Jesus' departure, which uh, was about to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men who stood with him. Jesus, as they were, just as they were leaving Jesus, Peter said, Teacher, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing, not knowing what he said. While Peter was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my child, my chosen. This is the one, this is one you shall this is this is the one to whom you shall listen. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days and they told no one of the things that they they had seen. Uh, this is the um, this is the new internet. This is like the an Oxford version. Uh, this is the inclusive version. So the inclusive version. That's why they say he's a child of God, not the son of God. They basically went through and they changed out the gendered pronouns. They made it more inclusive, uh, so that ladies, when they read this, could be like, yes, the the there's less of a block to the divine being feminine as well. So that's what you get. That's what you get in the Bible. And you know, quite frankly, Rogan, he's always criticizing the Bible uh, for it being. Uh, for it being lightweight, it being like hard to interpret, you know, it being a little bit shoddy. And that's a, that's a valid criticism. That's what you get. Now, here's what, now when Jesus show was showing Maria Valtorta uh, this image, and you can, dude, if you read the poem of the man, God, get ready. It's the, it's an ultimate spiritual experience. It took me years to read this thing. This is what you get from here. It's going to be a little bit long. Pull up a chair. Hell, I have a chair. I could sit down. All right. And then we'll call it a day. But here we go. I'm going to read this to you. Jesus says, this is Jesus talking to Maria Valtorta, says, put here the transfiguration as seen on August 5th, 1944, but without the dictation that I added to it. Um, After copying the transfiguration of last year, PM, one of the editors, will copy what I'm going to show you now. So Jesus was working with Maria Valtorta to to not only dictate this, but to assemble this. And here's here's what she sees. Here's what he says. 
the 5th of August, 1944. I am with my Jesus on a high mountain. So she's having an embodied experience, okay? That's why we're in 3D, baby. B embodied experience, okay? Um, I'm with my Jesus on a high mountain. Peter, James, and John are with Jesus. They climb higher up and their eyes rove over the horizons, the details of which are well-defined, even in the distance, in this beautiful and this clear day. The mountains... The mountain is not a part of this range of mountains like the one in Judea. It rises isolated with the, with, uh, with the east in the front with respect to the place where we are. The north is to the left and the south is to the right and to the rear and to the west is the summit, which is about 100 steps higher up. It is very high and the view extends over a very wide range. The lake of Gennesaret looks like a strip of sky that has come down to be set in the green of the earth an oval turquoise enclosed by emeralds of various shades, a mirror that trembles and ripples in a light breeze, and on which boats in full sail glide as nimbly as seagulls, lightly bent towards the blue water, exactly with the grace of flight of a kingfisher swimming on the water in search of prey. Then a vein of flowers out from the vast turquoise. It is a, it is a pale blue where the riverbed is wider and darker, where the banks grow narrow and the water is deeper, and in the shade of the trees that grow luxuriantly near the river, nourished by its water. The Jordan looks like an almost straight stroke of a brush in the greenery of some plain. Some villages are scattered here and there on both sides of the river. Some are only a handful of houses, others are somewhat larger, with the airs of the little towns. The main road are yellowish lines among the green. But here and there on the side of the mountain, the plain is more cultivated. It's more full, fertile, and it's really beautiful. The various hues of the several growths are the most pleasant sight and the most beautiful sunshine of a very clear day. God, are we just like in this scene? It's so it's like these the beautiful, the, the I mean, this is a sensory rich experience. What you get there is a little bit um, distilled, you can tell, right? But this is the same experience, all right, according to Christ. It must be springtime, perhaps the months of March. If I take into account the latitude of the Pal latitude of Palestine, because I can see corn, which is already high and already and still, although a little still green, waving like a blue green sea, and I see the crests of the early fruit trees decorating this little vegetable sea with something like tiny white and rosy clouds, and the meadows are strewn with flowers on and with high hay, where Grazing sheep look like piles of snow spread here and there on the green grass. Just near the mountain, on the low sort of hill at its foot, there are two little towns, one to the south and the other to the north. The very fertile plain extends particularly and more widely to the south. Jesus, after a short rest in the cool shade of the trees, a pause where he certainly, uh, a pause which he certainly granted out of pity for Peter, who clearly has a great difficulty in climbing, resumes going up. He, all, he, he goes almost to the top, where there is a grassy tableland with a semicircle of trees near the side of the mountain. You may rest, my friends. I'm going over there to pray. And he points to a large stone, a rock that appears on the surface of the mountain, and it is not near the slope, but lies internally towards the summit. Jesus kneels on it. Jesus kneels on the grass and he rests his hands and his head on the rock in a posture that he will also take up when he's praying in Gethsemane. The top of the mountain protects him from the sun. The remaining part of the grass-covered clearing is in the bright sun as far as the bordering trees where the apostles are sitting in the shade. Peter takes off his sandals, he shakes off dust and grit and remains barefooted with his, with his tired feet on the cool grass. Um, Almost lying down, with his head resting on the emerald green tuft as a pillow, James does the same, but in order to be comfortable, he looks for a tree against which he leans his mantle, uh, which, is like a, which is like a coat, and he rests his back. John remains sitting, looking at the master, but the calm of the place, the fresh breeze, the silence, and the fatigue overcoming him also overcome, and the fatigue overcome him also as he droops his head and his eyes. None of them are fast asleep, but they are in a state of summer drowsiness that stuns people. I keep looking, sorry, I keep looking back because I hope the camera's not cutting out because we're getting close to the end of the record time here, but sorry. They are aroused by a brilliancy. This is the transfiguration, okay? 
they are roused by a brilliancy that is so striking that it overwhelms them with the brightness of the sun. It spreads and penetrates even into the shade of the bushes and the trees where the apostles are. They open their eyes and are astonished at seeing Jesus transfigured. He is exactly as I see him in visions of paradise. Of course, he has no wounds and there is no banner of the cross, but the majesty of his face and his body is the same. The brightness is also the same as his garment, which is too, which too is identical. From deep red, it has changed into an immaterial fabric of diamonds and pearls in which he is clad in heaven. His face shines with an extremity in, a, in an intense sidereal light in which his sapphire eyes are beaming. He looks taller, as if his glorification had, his, had increased his height. I can not say whether the brilliancy which makes even the tableland phosphorescent emanates entirely from him, or whether his own is intermingled with the brightness and all that is the light of the universe and heaven that is concentrated within him. I can only say that it is something indescribable. Jesus is now standing, as I would... I just want to, I just want to stop there. My God. I mean, what uh, the, 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 the diamonds and the, the light of the, the heaven, the light of and the shining and the brightness of the sun, that is, that is so much more to sink your teeth into. There's, that is so much more electromagnetic radiation uh, resonance for the senses, for the, 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 the setting. Um, oh, okay, we'll keep going. I, I just, I, I want to make my point. My point is, um, there is just such a, there is such a richer kind of experience that one can experience in here. It doesn't mean that it makes that wrong. What it means is that it just adds to it. It makes it more glorious. It makes it more rich. It makes it more of a story that one can experience. It's like the difference between reading a book and seeing the movie. This is a little bit closer to the movie, you know, but it's still in your imagination, which means it can be even more potent and even more expansive. Okay. Jesus is now standing. I would say that he is raised off the ground between him and the grassy meadow. There is something like a luminous vapor, a space consisting only of a light upon which he seems to be standing. But if, but it is so bright that I may be wrong, and the fact that I no longer see any green grass under Jesus' feet may be due to the bright light that vibrates and waves, as is often seen in bonfires. It is a snow-white incandescent light, Jesus is looking at the sky and is smiling at a vision that enraptures him. The apostles almost afraid and they the apostles are almost afraid and they call they call him as he is transfigured so much that he no longer appears to be their master. Master, master, they call in low voices full of anxiety. He does not hear. He is in an ecstasy, says Peter trembling. I wonder what he sees. The three are now standing up. They would like to approach Jesus but they dare not. The light increases further because of, because of two lights that descend from the sky and take place at Jesus' side. When they settle on the tableland, their veils open, and two majestic bright personages appear. One is more elderly than the other, with a sharp, severe countenance, and he has a double-pointed beard. Two horns of light depart from his forehead and make me understand that he is Moses. The other one is emaciated, bearded and hairy, more or less like the Baptist, whom I would say he resembles in height, leanness, structure, and severity. John the Baptist, Elijah. Um, while the light emanated from Moses is white, like the light of Jesus, particularly with regard to the beams issuing from his forehead, the light of Elijah is like the bright flame of the sun. The two prophets uh, take a reverential attitude before their God incarnate, and although he speaks to them with familiarity, they do not drop their respectful attitude. I do not understand even one word of what they speak. The three apostles fall to their knees. They tremble. They cover their faces with their hands. They would like to look, but they're afraid. At last, Peter says, Master, listen to me. Jesus looks around and smiling towards his Peter, who takes heart again. And he says, It is wonderful to be here with you, Moses and Elijah. If you wish, we will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and we will stay here and we will serve you. Jesus looks at him again more more warmly. He, He looks also at John and James, a glance that is a loving embrace. Also, Moses and Elijah stare at the three. Their eyes flash fire. They must be like rays which pierce hearts. The apostles dare not say anything, 
frightened as they are, they lapse into silence. They look as if they're inebriated, like people who are bewildered. But when a veil, which is neither a fog nor a cloud nor a ray, envelops the three gorgeous, glorious personalities behind a screen that is even brighter than the one that surrounded them previously and hides from them the sight of the apostles, a powerful, harmonious voice vi with vibration fills the air and the three bow down and their faces are on the grass. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter, uh, listen to him. I'm going to stop there because that makes I think that makes the point that I'm saying. Um, the poem of the man God, um, the gospel of Jesus, as Jesus called it, um, it's this incredible book. And um, the global reader, the person who reads this book, there's an audio version, an audio book version available of it from uh, through uh, a company, uh, Medias Paul. It's out of Canada. Um, the person who reads it is named Father Peter Bowes. And Father Peter Bowes was my mentor and my teacher for um, eight years. Um, he ground me down into dust, blew away my ego. And the only thing remaining there was my God self. And um, that was his particular project with me and with a lot of people was uh, a via negativa. There's via positiva, which is the, the art of, or the, the path of via, the life uh, the, via the positive, via the adding, and then there's the via negativa, or the, or the taking away from. And Father Peter, for me, was a mentor that was very the way of the removal. He removed everything that wasn't God from me and did his best to stand me in a place where um, it was just me and it was just God. Um, he is the one, if you, if you get the audio book of Maria Valtorti, he's the one that reads all five of these into... Uh, into the audiobook that is that. It's kind of cool because um, Father, I helped Father Peter record um, and I edited, I did the audio editing on his, um, whatchamacallit, on his autobiography, uh, The Way, the Truth, and the Light. It's the autobiography of a Christian master. And I was there the night that he started writing it. And I was there when he made the audiobook. And I was there when he, um, when he finished it and when he published it. On, and you can get that one on Audible. Um, all that editing in there all, uh, was me. So if you hear any pops or cracks, that's me. Um, let me finish up this thing. So we've taken a pretty cool... Let me, let me put a little bow on this. This is the Bible, which so many Christians love all over the world. And sometimes people say it's the only authority. Well, Jesus, a spirit, communicated an electromagnetic spirit, you know, resonant in the electromagnetic spectrum, communicated to Maria Valtorta without a body. Sometimes he would appear physically, sometimes he would appear um, in her mind, in her heart, right? And he wrote the poem of the man God through her, which is like this insane level miracle. When you, when you read it, when you experience it, you get to be with Christ on his walk through life. And there is nothing that will substitute for that level of experience. Um, it, it, it creates the possibility of such a rich uh, relationship. If you love Jesus, if you've studied Jesus, or you want to know more about him, reading the poem of the man God is, um, is a way, man. And it's a way where you're going to go on this adventure. You're going to have to make up your mind for yourself. If you and, and a spiritual teacher of yours both read poem of the man God, all 5,000 pages, come on, you're going to have one experience and whoever is reading it or, or you're going to, your teacher is going to have another. What I mean to say is authority. You are going to have to mediate the authority of that experience for yourself. And that is one of the themes that I hope to return to over and over again here in our, uh, our conversations. Um, just like those early Christians out in the desert had all their books and then they kind of, kind of got it uh, narrowed down to one set of books with a particular probably editorial slant associated with it. Um, people, ex including this experience, it's all mediated, my friends. There's only one of you, and there's only one of you for all time. And so you're going to, at some point, have to mediate the experience for yourself of the divine. And um, in our conversations, I hope that we can talk about ways that you can do that, ways that I've seen it stabilized in others and stabilize it in myself, ways that you can live with it 
every day because it is a rich, rich adventure. And it is my pleasure uh, to be on this adventure with you. Uh, we're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about spirituality. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. And hopefully I can keep making these or something like it until the day that I die because I really feel like I was made to do this, to have these kinds of conversations with you. And I'm glad that I took the two years to build our universe classroom. And the, the reason it took me two years is because when I had that amazing classroom, uh, it, was, it was theater. It was 3D learning. It was, it was students applying what they were doing in multiple dimensions. And a one little frame, I couldn't do it. I couldn't put the classroom into one little frame. I had to put it into this. And so we're going to, um, we're going to fire this thing up and we are going to uh, create something that is fun and exciting and meant for you so that your nervous system can know this stuff and it can, um, you can know it for yourself. So bless you. God bless you. May the spirit of the true God that is inside you touch you and work with you and explain and express itself to you. And may your heart know the unlimited joy of coming face to face with the creator of all things so that our world can get better, friends, so that we can all draw what we need to make the changes and the modifications and the growth. Maybe we can even do it together. Take it easy.